Good evening. It's now six o'clock and welcome to our final council meeting of 2019. <laughs> there are nine very relieved people up the front here, uh, given the long year it has been. Welcome. I declare this meeting of the Planning Committee for the Port Phillip City Council open and I welcome the members of the public who are here tonight. The City of Port Phillip respectfully acknowledges the Yalakut Willem clan of the Boon We pay our respects to their elders, both past and present. We acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to this land. Council has a local law that determines how this meeting will be conducted. There is a time allotted in tonight's agenda for public question time. There is also an opportunity for members of the public to ask a question or make a comment on a specific item on tonight's agenda. This will be done prior to the committee considering the item. If you wish to ask a question or speak to a report, please complete the blue form that is available at the table just outside the chamber and hand it to a staff member. If you have already registered online, please ensure you let a staff member know you are present. I encourage you to try to limit your questions and comments to around three minutes and to try to avoid repeating any points that have been previously made by other speakers, as good a points as they are. This committee can only address questions and deal with items within its delegation, that is, planning matters. All planning committee meetings are live streamed to allow the community to watch and listen to meetings in real time. Please note that under Council's local law, this meeting cannot be filmed or audio taped unless permission is granted by the Chair. In the unlikely event of an emergency evacuation, please follow the instructions of the emergency warden, which tonight is sitting over here. Thank you very much. Councillors, agenda item one, apologies. Councillors, we are all present, so we do not have any apologies here tonight. Agenda item two, minutes of previous meetings. Councillors, the minutes of the Planning Committee meeting held on 27 November 2019 have been circulated. Are there any questions relating to these minutes? That'd be a no. If not, can I have a motion to confirm these minutes moved by Councillor Gross? Do I have a seconder? Councillor Pearl? I will now put the motion. All those in favour? All those against? The motion is carried. Declarations of conflict of interest. Does any councillor have a conflict of interest in a matter being discussed at tonight's meeting? Councillor Baxter. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I, Councillor Tim Baxter, declare that in relation to item 6.1, Amendment C174 Port, Extension of Heritage Overlay 8, Tyena Grove, Elwood, consideration of submissions and request to proceed to an independent planning panel, that I have an indirect conflict of interest due to a conflicting duty in this matter. Thank you, Councillor Baxter. Does any other councillor have a conflict of interest? No. Item number four, public question time. Councillors, we have no members of the public who have requested to ask a question tonight, so we will move on. Agenda, sorry, agenda item five, councillor question time. Councillors, are there any questions for the officers? That's a no, we will move on. Agenda item six, presentation of reports. I'll now move to presentation of reports. Agenda items 6.1 to 6.5. Uh, agenda item 6.1, C1, amendment C174 port, extension of heritage overlay eight to Inia Grove, Elwood consideration of submissions and requests to proceed to an independent planning panel. We have one member of the public who wishes to speak, and Councillor Baxter. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, once again, I, Councillor Tim Baxter, declare that in relation to item 6.1, Amendment C174, Port, Extension of Heritage Overlay 8, Tyena Grove, Elwood, consideration of submissions and request to proceed to an independent planning panel, that I have an indirect conflict of interest due to a conflicting duty in this matter, and I will uh, leave for the duration of the item. Thank you, Councillor Baxter. As mentioned, we have one member of the public who wishes to speak. I now call on Mark Richardson to address Council. Thank you. Mark, if you could just take a seat, press the button to turn the microphone on and state your name and suburb. Thank you. 
Uh, good evening, it's Mark Richardson, Elwood. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Just a question in regard to this uh, particular matter. Um, uh, while there are some premises um, that, that have clear heritage um, um, background with red brick and federation roofs and so on, I'd like to ask that um, uh, consideration be given to looking at 21 to 23 Tyner Grove, which is a wonderful mid-century uh, modern um, set of flats and that that um, uh, be assessed in that context rather than whether it's a um, heritage um, conventional uh, property. Uh, so the council officer's recommendation appeared to just completely miss that and say it's not, it's not an old property, therefore it should go. Um, that's not what had been recommended by um, uh, the architect, Peter Barrett. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Richardson. And that's all the members of the public to speak to that item. Councillors, do you have any questions of the officers? Councillor Brand. Um, yes, do we have any uh, further information about the about 21 to 23 uh, Tyona Grove in terms of its um, architecture? Uh, through you, Mr Chair, um, we revised this um, when responding to the submissions um, and uh, the property was assessed um, in the original Port Phillip Heritage Review in nine, sorry, in Port Phillip Heritage Review 1997, um, and uh, it was assessed as being not important of a contemporary period, uh, and that it was a, a block of flats. Um, based on these field notes uh, from 1997, this should have been translated into the um, into the Heritage Review uh, with a not important status. Uh, however, there appears to have been a translation error uh, and 21 to 23 Toyuna Grove was added as a local importance D. Um, and so then when this system was transferred into the current system that we have now, um, the gradings A, B, C and D um, were transferred into being significant places within the system that we currently use. Um, the heritage uh, assessment carried out by um, Peter Barrett recommended that 21 to 23 Tainer Grove um, be removed from HO8 as it is a contemporary development um, which has no appreciable value to the precinct. Um, neither the current or the proposed citation for HO8 refers to 1960s flats as being of heritage significance to the precinct. Councillors, are there any further questions? Councillor Brand? Can I just ask an, an opinion on if it was excluded from consideration in the heritage overlay, was that because uh, it didn't fit with the overall statement of significance for the overlay, or and that was just enough to exclude it, or could it have been included if it had been thought of as a significant but, um, uh, uh, what's, the, what, what's the word, sort of um, inconsistent part of the, of the overlay but still nevertheless individually important somehow? So through you, Mr Chair. So um, the properties were excluded on the basis that they weren't considered to be significant in the context of the statement of... Sorry, can you hear me? Oh. <laughs> they weren't considered to be significant on the basis that they're not consistent with the significance outlined in the statement of significance. Fair enough. <laughs> Councillors, do we have any further questions? Councillor Brand. So just the implication of that is that uh, a 1960s block of flats, no matter how individu of individual merit it could have been, it would have been excluded because it wasn't responding to the terms of the heritage overlay itself. That's correct. Councillor Crawford. I know that we're reviewing other parts of Elwood in the near future. That won't be caught up in that. Would that have a different frame to look at and this building would be excluded from that or included? Do you know how we were reviewing some of the Elwood? Would it there before be re-looked at or not? Uh, through you, Mr Chair, yes, it could be re-looked at um, when we, we do the review of other parts of Elwood. If we, take, if we deem that sort of 
um, 60s architecture as part of the uh, consideration of that yeah, heritage assessment. Councillors, are there any further questions? That being no, we have, councillors, we have an officer's recommendation. Would someone like to move this or something different? Councillor Gross? Thank you, Councillor Gross. Do we have a second? Councillor Simic? Councillor Gross, would you like to speak to the recommendation? Um, so this is where council acts like a post box. Uh, we've put, done some work on the heritage. Um, we're receiving the uh, submissions and we're thinking about that and then it goes off to a panel and uh, I think this is laudable. This is an area that's of deep community interest and attention and um, it only recently in an interim process received heritage recognition for the uh, important buildings that are covered by this application. So or this planning scheme amendment, I should say. So I have no hesitation in, use, in moving this rather mechanistic resolution. Thank you. Councillor Gross. Councillor Simic, would you like to speak to the motion? Would any other councillor like to speak to the motion? Councillor Brand? Yes, this is um, <coughs> a, a, a crucial but non-controversial part, I think, of the, of the whole process of winning heritage recognition for these these houses um, and I think it actually does reflect something of the of the argument and the contention which has been going on I think there, there obviously have been uh, objectors to it who would like to see more heritage protection for those buildings internal protections and what have you and I just want to say they have been those requests have been considered and questioned by us councillors and considered by officers at, at length and and basically uh, the heritage protection that these houses and the streetscape is getting is the same, pretty much the same protection as most of our heritage areas give and nothing particularly more because there isn't anything seen to be notably more in this street than any other street. The victory has been to actually get it recognised as a, as a heritage worthy, her, a street worthy of heritage protection and that has been a fantastic achievement. Um, what we do with it procedurally today is just a little, yeah, it's, it's not a fantastic achievement at all. It's already the interim controls which are actually controlling the BCAT hearing at the moment are what has saved them and this is just uh, um, changing its status from interim to permanent. Thank you, Councillor Brand. Would any other councillor like to speak for or against the motion? That's a no. Councillor Gross, would you like to close? No. In that case then, councillors, I put the motion. All those in favour? That is passed unanimously. Item 6.2, Amendment C17. Sorry, we need Baxter back before I proceed. Welcome back, Councillor Baxter. Item 6.2, Amendment C171, Port, St Kilda Marina, hearing and receiving of submissions. Councillors, we have about 10 speakers to this particular item. I now call upon the first speaker, Anna Borthwick. If you could have a seat and state your name and suburb for the record. Hello, my name's Anna Borthwick. I'm from Plan A. I'm actually representing 92 submitters to Amendment C171 um, for the St Kilda Marina. These residents are located within um, the city of Port Phillip, but also outside the municipality. However, they've put a submission into the amendment as they've got a connection um, to the marina. So I just really wanted to reiterate our written submission. Um, first of all, we congratulate Council on this amendment. We uh, applaud that 
there's a new master plan for the marina. Um, the submitters do, however, have some concerns regarding the proposed amendment, particularly where um, we believe that it's not in accordance with or doesn't support some of the local and state policy in terms of responding to the context and the place that it's located. And we feel this is the case because of um, some of the built form that's proposed as part of those guidelines. Um, we feel that this conflicts with the um, the context being a open and inviting environment of the marina. We understand the marina needs to operate um, and we support the ongoing operation of the marina. However, we would like to see some um, further direction with regards to some of the guidelines that are ambiguous, particularly with regards to uh, setbacks of new buildings that are proposed at the marina, building separations, um, and ensuring that the um, overall um, height and massing of those buildings remains sympathetic to the um, area of the marina um, and that it really does reflect that existing um, open space and inviting and engaging uh, environment to both uh, users of the marina but then also visitors to, to the marina as well. So, um, as I said, we support it. Um, however, we would at this stage seek that uh, review is undertaken on some of those guidelines with regards to the building height setback and massing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, call upon Jeff Gowers. Jeff Gowers, not here. Uh, Stephen Bitmead for Fastnet Consulting. Thank you, Stephen. If you could just state your name and suburb for the record. Uh, Stephen Bitmead. I'm here representing a number of residents in Marine Parade, Thackeray Street, Dixon and um, Hood Street. Uh, essentially, the comments the, for the first speaker we also echo. Uh, essentially, we recognise, the residents recognise that the marina is a very important, prominent site. It's important for a number of reasons and it's important in terms of the potential impact that the redevelopment will have on the surrounding residents. Essentially, the site brief as part of this amendment forms the DPO document, and that DPO document that excludes third party involvement, rights, appeal rights, once the amendment is preceded, places an emphasis on that development plan overlay to be robust in terms of explaining the rationale behind the height controls, the mandatory, uh, particularly the areas one and two where there's a 12 and 15 metre height. And we say in our submissions that that brief does not contain that necessary justification to support the proposed heights in terms of the context. We're not saying it's right, we're not saying it's wrong. We're just saying that it, there needs to be more justification in understanding how council arrived at that urban design framework. And why that is so important, as I said before and can't stress enough, that the DPO document forms the discretion for which the residents will be excluded once the amendment is approved. So the time for the residents to understand the direction that council is pursuing in terms of the policy and what's the objections, objectives they are attempting to achieve must be enunciated to a greater degree that is in the current documentation. And one of the failings that we see is that there is not a detailed urban design framework of which to acknowledge and inform the residents of what that built form will be. Perfect example. One of the underpinning principles is the maintaining of buildings on site and the redevelopment to the low scale nature of the area. That means and suggests that a building height far less than the 15 and 12 metre height contemplated. So it's council's responsibility, we say, in considering the next stage, which is considering the submissions, is to embrace the opinions of the neighbourhood in providing further analysis and justification in particular to the built form so as the position in relation to the redevelopment can be better explained. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, next speaker, Philip Bird. Philip, if you could take your seat and state your name and suburb for the record. So I beg your pardon. My name is Philip Bird. I live in Marine Parade, St Kilda, right opposite the marina. Uh, I just want to step through six or seven items. I have a three-minute uh, limit. Firstly, there's been no traffic study alluded to at all. Number two, there's no environmental study uh, on, on the effect to the coast there. I believe there are penguins along the side there. Is that going to disrupt the penguins on the St Kilda Pier? No. You know, these things should be investigated before things are approved. Uh, and the idea, number three, of taking more public land from that park for a car park uh, so that you can build the building in the current car park, I think is disgraceful. Uh, there are plans, from what I can understand, number four, for boat sheds to be on uh, Marine Parade. That will totally. Uh, there can there can be buildings along Marine Parade there. They they, fifty percent of it can be built up with these buildings. It will totally ruin the, the view across the water and the maritime views there. Uh, I think it's it's terrible. Uh, if there are to be any more boat sheds, I suggest they should be on the west side. That is. Uh, near the coast, there's enough room behind the current boat sheds there. That's, that's where anything further should go, I believe. Um, number seven. It's interesting to look what's happened to the site in recent years. We have Rollo's kiosk built there. There was no notice, no consultation, no objection process, and this freestanding building was put up. Appalling. And given that, I'd like to remind people that if one looks back over the last two decades of development along the coastline here in St Kilda, the processes and the outcomes from a couple of projects, uh, for instance, the sea bars and the triangle, would uh, make us have very little confidence in this process and I do believe uh, the council is letting us down very badly by putting this up. Thank you for your time. Thank you Mr Bird. I call upon Artemis Domingos. If you could just have a seat and state your name and suburb. Thank you. Certainly. Um, I've got some slides as well. My name is Artemis de Megos. Um, I live on Marine Parade, uh, Elwood. Um, dear Chair, councillors and members of the public, thank you for being here tonight. Um, I've got six slides and I just want to talk about them and um, I think pictures paint a thousand words. I googled best practice or uh, most beautiful marinas in the world. Um, best practice marinas in the world and I've put them in all four corners and they're all from all four corners of the world so um, South America, North America, Europe and Asia and in the middle there I've put our St Kilda Marina and I just want everyone to see that it is best practice it looks like it matches all the others it's open, it's got a lot of beautiful views, you can see the city, you can see the bay, the sunsets, it's visual, anyone driving past, walking past, jogging past, sees it and enjoys it. I grew up enjoying that view. I used to tell my dad, please drive me past the marina whenever we would go in the area, because I'd just look for it, you know what I mean? Um, it's got a lot of vegetation, you can see all the others, there's, there's buildings are not built right up next to the boats. And the, our photo of the marina there, that strip there is right next to... There's plans to put three storeys um, high buildings there that will completely block it out. The thing is, it will block out views in and views out. So in the marina, anywhere you stand, you can see the bay, you can see the, the vegetation and so forth. 
The oh, oh, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, these are from the site brief. Um, we'll look on the left-hand side. Currently, people um, park their boats. So the marina accommodates people with big budgets, and they've got boats in sitting in the water. People with they want to spend a bit less, they can have it in dry storage. And people that just want to bring it on the day on their trailer, it accommodates all people, which is what we want as a public facility, not just for high-enders, but for everyone. So people with, that want to bring their boat just by themselves, they drop it where we all know, and they park their car there, and they can just walk straight back to their boat, they can moor it. Very simple process um, and safe. Now the new process will be to put the trailer park in Moraine Reserve, and they have to walk up to that top red bit to launch their boat. And they can't see their, boat, their, their car or their boat if they're a one-person operator, and it's quite a distance to walk. Um, I don't see that as being conducive or facilitating the people that use trailers to bring their boats. I think it's, it's more of an uh, adherence. Um, now, going to the right-hand side, they're the envelopes where buildings want to be placed. Um, the purple is obviously four storeys high and the, th the, the pink is three storeys high. Again, that blocks the views out for basically everyone. You could almost imagine a square box that's enclosed the marina. And what we were saying before was the marina is a work of art. It's beautiful. Um, you saw the other ones from around the world. It's an icon of St Kilda. It's like the um, Luna Park and the Palais Theatre. It's just... Mr, Mr. Dominguez, we're at three minutes. If you could okay. um, get through the rest of your four slides. Yep, I believe yep. there's four to go. Yep. So the park is public place um, and it's vegetated and we're going to turn it into, a, into a, um, a trailer park, which I don't think is appropriate. Can we... Next slide, please. Um, that's a... a, a an aerial of the marina, and I've put with my finger um, boxes of where the building's going to be proposed to be, to be placed. You can see it's going to be blocked out everywhere. You won't be able to see the boat sheds. If the heritage is listed, it doesn't matter because nobody can see them. And it will block out all the views of the, of the, of the sea, of the bay. Mr. Dwayne, you're at four minutes if you okay. could. And that's what sort of constructions we can probably expect. Um, it, there's, got no, there's no foundations there. Um, it has to be prefab. Can we, next slide, please. Uh, the penguins, it's important we do something for them. It's not mentioned in the reports. We need cat proof fences, dog proof fences, and something there, and access to the beach. Last, next slide, please. And the foreshore has rubbish everywhere rocks, bricks, building materials. It's really inappropriate. Uh, that needs to be cleaned up. It's been there for 50 years. I'm quick to the last slide, please. I googled seawalls and best practice around the world. How would that look in Marine Reserve and along the St Kilda Marina? We need to improve it. It's already world class, and I just want something really nice. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Domingos. Uh, call upon Trevor White. Mr. White, if you could just state your name and suburb for the record. Sure, thank you very much, uh, councillors. Um, my name is Trevor White, I live in St Kilda. Uh, I've got a series of questions, so I'll try and be, uh, I'll keep within the minutes. Uh, are councillors and the council audit committee comfortable with the strategic master planning approach that, it, that has now required the C71 planning amendment to allow future development and operations of the marina lease? Second question. The master plan relies on a developer operating uh, or operator to fund the redevelopment of a marina that has already been master planned uh, and in design by council, which may not be financially viable nor operational feasible. What is the contingency plan and process if the developer wants to change the master plan? We have been advised that the current service station and other sub tenants leases. Uh, conclude at the end of the current head lease uh, extension. Is this correct and are they paying rates and if not, why not? 
even though council has uh, departmental advice, uh, the current head tenant, if the current head tenant is unsuccessful, is council ready for the potential appeal to the Supreme Court on the basis that the council is not following the process as outlined in the Crown Lands Reserve Act or other, re other reasons, like seeking the proposal for the developers' proposals are coming in now, even though there's no planning scheme amendment in place. So how can the person actually put in a proper proposal if they don't know what the planning scheme is? Can the CEO inform the ratepayers and as to the number of commercially experienced and expert additional staff that would be required to manage the process and how much of council funds would be required to employ the staff, the consultants and undertake the capital works and repair the assets that the council has just bought or the assets they've just bought are very old. Given the structural condition of the dry boat storage sheds and the timber fibreglass non-functional beacon, how can these items be classified as heritage when in fact they may require demolition? No one should get an unconditional 50-year lease without a five-year step review measuring compliance, usage, customer and stakeholder feedback, future directions and operational maintenance issues. This was not the case for the last 50-year lease and as a result there's virtually nothing done on the site for the last 50 years except adding a few more buildings. It should be noted that the removal of third party appeal rights led to the St Kilda Triangle, which a few people are remember, remember that activity. In summary, pardon? Oh, good. Anyway, it's still uh, in some people's memory. Uh, in summary, uh, the proposed C171 amendment should go to an expert external panel for review. And I would urge, urge Council not to make a decision lightly because this. This facility is a once in a opportunity, once in a lifetime opportunity to, to get it right, and we're concerned that some of the processes and some of the preconceived theoretical pl master planning ideas may not be financially viable for any developer to put in a proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. White. Uh, I call upon Susanna Lobez. Thank you. If you could just take a seat and state your name and suburb for the record. Good evening, councillors. I'm Susanna Lobez, and uh, for 40 years this month, I have been a ratepayer in St Kilda. Um, I've got a, a few questions uh, which I sent in on the online submission form. Uh, one of my concerns relates to the community engagement panel report, uh, where there was uh, a very clear uh, indication given that a less is more approach a low impact high quality development rather than a larger commercial development uh, is optimal that the, a conservative approach should be taken. Um, I do have concerns about another draw card being put in my area. I'm right in the middle of the 10 minute walking zone that's in, used in some of the doc documents and there are a lot of draw cards already there and we have a lot of tourists and we ha now have to pay for parking in our streets, on street parking which we never had to do in the 40 years that I've been here. Um, under the site's brief, um, they talk about at 2.2, they talk about the site vision and the objectives involving commerciality and more drawing of people. That's a concern to many residents. Uh, we wonder whether there's a demand for this kind of development given Fitzroy Street is clearly underutilised and under-rented. Um, under Para 3 on 2.2 of the site brief, the local policy states that any development should not increase traffic congestion parking issues or pedestrian and cyclist issues and I do question whether the 1965 Act is, is out of use. It seems to me that that Act stipulates the area should be reserved for a marina and providing facilities for the recreational convenience of boat users and the public. So I do also have specific concerns about the car parking. At the moment, uh, the uh, report uh, at 6.3.3 says there's 139 spaces with a low occupancy rate on a Saturday of 14%. My suggestion to Council is that 
Nobody wants to park in those $5.50 an hour spots. No one does it opposite Wordsworth Street where I live. They all want to park in residence streets and that's impacting on the residents dramatically. I have major concerns about the exclusion of third party appeal rights and consultation with residents. Um, but apart from that, um, I endorse the other reservations that have been expressed. Thank you, Suzanne. I now call upon Mr Peter Holland. Peter, if you could just state your name and suburb for the record. Peter Holland, um, St Kilda. Uh, as Susanna said, the St Kilda Land Act defines a marina as uh, one that provides uh, facilities for recreation, comfort and convenience of members of the public. It's not just for the boat owners. And I'm hoping that we'll have a small but significant harbour village there with restaurant, cafes and other recreational facilities for the general public. Um, in my submission I raised a number of concerns. <clears throat> in particular, I think there should be a stronger incentive to build a bridge over the marina mouth. Uh, I think that the heritage overlay is ludicrous since it's based on a, the false premise that the infrastructure is substantially intact at the moment and there's various procedural issues. But I think that the time to elaborate on those concerns is at the independent panel stage, so I don't want to go into that now. Um, instead, what I want to talk about is public participation in this process. Um, now, I hate to use the, uh, that ugly term, NIMBY, because I think it's quite appropriate for the immediate neighbours to be concerned and to um, be actively involved. But of course, council also has to take into account the interests of the general public, both residents and visitors alike. So how should council do this? Now, my broad concern is that there's a trend at all levels of government for increasing levels of secrecy in our society. We have these grinned-faced probity advisers and empire-building bureaucrats who are taking power away from our elected representatives and from the general community. There's a variety of devices. We have probity provisions. We have commercial in confidence claims. We have FOI exceptions. We have cabinet secrecy claims, token public participation, etc. And the counter movement is being led by a variety of forces, including uh, a move towards the open society being led by the John Cain Foundation, chaired by the former Premier, who was the father of our FOI legislation. So when we put that sort of matrix into our proposed consultation here, what do we see? Basically, I think it's too little, too late. We have the formal process that we're going through, such as this and an informal process that we're promised where the community consult on the detailed design once council has decided on a preferred tenderer. <coughs> I suggest that we can do much more. And there's a suggestion that's been floating around the Kane Foundation for some time, that where we have a project like this, there can be a beauty parade of the shortlisted tenderers. Now I'm hoping that all three of our shortlisted tenderers are going to come up with some interesting and exciting ideas. And I think that what Council could do is to set up a beauty parade of those three uh, ideas, shorn of confidential information, uh, and make it available to the interested public. I think this would assuage some of the concerns of the immediate neighbours. It would stimulate interest from the general public it would give the councillors a better database to make their decision that they're ultimately going to make. And it would mean that we're in full compliance with our obligations under the Victorian Charter of Human Rights that guarantees the public a right to participate in the conduct of public affairs. <clears throat> so I strongly urge councillors to think about the possibility of being at the forefront of the move to an open society. The city of Port Phillip should be leading the way. And one way of doing this is to think about setting up some sort of uh, beauty parade of the shortlist attenders before council makes its, its submission. Now, I don't expect anything to come of this tonight, but I will be contacting the councillors individually and asking whether there's some councillors who are courageous enough to champion this idea and to try to put Port Phillip into the forefront of the open society. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr Holland. <laughs> I call upon Mr Alan Richardson.
Mr Richardson, if you could just take a seat and state your name and suburb for the record. Thank you. I'm a Richardson, uh, resident of Elwood uh, Marine Parade for 50 years. I'm not a newcomer. I, uh, I served as a lifesaver at St Kilda uh, in the 60s. Um, 30 years ago, I was asked to... Um, by a then councillor, John Cribbies, to join him on a committee called the Elwood Foreshore Committee. Now we, our brief was to, um, to map out parts of the foreshore right from the marina through to Head Street. We did a lot of work on it. A lot of well-meaning people, uh, and it was, you know, it was for the good of the area. Marine Reserve was designated uh, passive recreation. The other side of the canal was uh, one side of the canal was for kite flying. The other side was for uh, barbecue area and play, uh, play um, equipment. Yes, sorry, thanks. And uh, yeah, and so we, um, and so it went all the way around. Now the thing that came out of it mostly was that everyone agreed from the then government of the day that um, that there shouldn't be any buildings there that weren't water related. Think about that. Do we need a hotel and big buildings to block out the sea? What we have in, in Elwood is something that they don't have in Sydney. Sydney, eat your heart out. We can stand there and watch the sun set on the water. They can't do that in Sydney. So basically, I th I've looked at the plans and I think there's too much and I don't know how you can possibly take part of a... a a reclaimed part of Moran Reserve and make it into a commercial part. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Richardson. <laughs> now call upon Helen Halliday. Ms Halliday, if you could take a seat and state your name and suburb for the record. Uh, my name is Helen Halliday. I live in Tube, Albion Street, Balaclava. Um, my presentation should be short and swift. Um, it seems to me that on two occasions tonight, all of the councillors have acted, again, uh, in, not um, with the full awareness of the impact of climate change, sea level rise and storm surge. I would have thought that this was an ideal opportunity to provide another um, reef similar to what is uh, uh, w what happens in relation to the St Kilda Pier and the um, Royal Melbourne Yacht Squadron, and in so doing, would provide pr protection for the Elwood Canal and the Elwood area from at least st um, storm surge, if not sea level rise. I can't see any adaptation that this offers to. Um, uh, to the community and so I would like to hope that uh, perhaps another plan will emerge which is more adaptable and which allows the opportunity for um, a marina which um, is further out and provides protection to the Elwood Canal. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hallado. Uh, call upon Lindsay Davis.
Lindsay Davis, Elwood. <coughs> um, I'm re representing myself and my partner, Jill Garner. Um, we support the careful work of the master plan and the inclusion of community input. Design project ambitions are well stated in the brief. However, a process to ensure that these are skillfully translated into a design outcome is critical. The decision to rezone the marina from, from PPRZ to SUZ with schedule and introduce a DPO with schedule seems a blunt tool that needs interrogation to limit the risk of unintended consequences. We are concerned that the built form envelopes suggested in the brief, figure 16, are too diagrammatic and not based on a concept that investigates formal impact. We support the extension of the heritage overlay, but we think that it will prove to be a challenging um, judgment for Council's heritage officers to make with respect to um, appropriate fit and quality contemporary buildings. So a process of, for the judgment of heritage contemporary excellence needs to be detailed. We, suggest, um, we also suggest that the marina and surrounds are significant and an important place of glo potentially global status. So new buildings on the site need design excellence. Uh, and we are, we're concerned that um, the design excellence hasn't been addressed in the brief. In fact, we couldn't find a reference to it. We recommend a process that has project design principles uh, outlined in the brief, seriously committed to key measurable project requirements. Um, we think there needs to be informed judgment to assess the design capability and capacity of all consultants that will be working on the project to ensure that the highest quality design input uh, is achieved. And these um, design principles should be non-negotiable. A process of design review is required and we understand the council has put a panel together of um, suitably qualified experts, so that's applauded. Um, however, we think a, a very detailed process is required to ensure that the, um, that the planning amendments are carried through in what ultimately we're all going to see, which is the built form result. Um, and at this stage, there is no discussion on how that might be achieved and how ultimately it might be um, managed by council. Without investigation, the 12 metre height limit that's proposed might be too high um, on the foreshore. And the unintended consequences of the diagram, which is figure 16 in the report, are, um, are potentially quite damaging. Um, by unintended consequences, we're referring to an envelope which uh, doesn't seem to have uh, a sophisticated level of architectural or urban design analysis. We're told it does, but that's not evident in the report. Um, form relationships need co consideration across the site, and, we, and the master plan also suggests dry storage to 15 metres high uh, is also of significant concern. Mr Davis, you've had four minutes. If you could come to the no conclusion. Problem. Thank you. Um, that's really it, I guess. Thank you very much. You. And that concludes the number of speakers on my list. Was there anyone who we've missed? No. All right. Councillors, do you have any questions of the officers? Councillor Gross. I, I've got a, a, a few. Can I just sort of... Um ask them and see how I go. Um, the first question I wanted to ask about is the built form on the Marine Parade side. Um, could you explain to us um, 
because we did a lot of talk in the uh, panel stage about view lines. Could you tell us about how view lines from Marine Parade to the uh, into the harbour, how they, those will be accommodated or even expanded? Well, that, okay, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, particularly along Marine Parade, uh, the the pink building envelope that people are referring to, uh, which in the diagrammatic form extends along the length of um, Marine Parade, uh, in the controls themselves, only 50% of that is allowed to um, be taken up with building. Um, we believe that that's actually less than the built form that they're at the moment in, in, in total and that that will create greater opportunities for views into the site and, and from the site um, back towards St Kilda and Marine Parade. Thank you very much. Um, Go ahead, Councillor Cross. Um, Sorry. So we, we had uh, contradictory article um, views on the heritage. Um, one of those views was that the heritage might encumber redevelopment of the uh, dry storage. Could you explain how that might not necessarily be the case? Uh, through you, Mr Chair. Uh, one of the things that the, um, the heritage citation was noting, that the importance of the marina is is that it is an operating marina and that the uh, objective of this process is to continue uh, that process. Um, and uh, I believe that um, at, at different times we've used the analogy of the MCG to describe to people um, uh, how proposed changes um, to heritage uh, within a heritage overlay don't necessarily mean that the fabric uh, within that can't change. So, for example, uh, the MCG has a heritage listing over it, uh, which recognises its cultural significance, and yet most of the buildings have been replaced, or well, all of the buildings there have been replaced over time, including some of the, um, the, the old heritage, what were at the time deemed heritage stands. The marina, similarly, uh, the, her the, the primary um, objective of the citation is to recognise the marina as a working marina, um, and, and therefore, uh, if components of that then need to change um, to facilitate its continuing operation of a marina, then they would be allowed. Uh, what the heritage overlay does is or mean that um, as part of the process, uh, uh, any change to those existing buildings needs to be assessed within that broader heritage context. Thanks very much. Uh, just two more, Mr Dewar. Um, there were the two remaining questions are in the documentation could you talk about how design excellence is uh, referred to and also how adaptation to climate change and sea level rise is referred to Uh, through, through you, Mr Chair. Uh, design excellence uh, is actually um, written into the document. Uh, for example, on page 58, where we look at the, the criteria for the, do for the dry storage, um, uh, 9.2.5, where it says that um, must demonstrate design excellence responding to its visual prominence on the esplanade and visibility from key public places in the marina. Um, uh, uh, it does also uh, design excellence does also occur in another uh, another couple of those criteria sections, and there is actually a, a definition of what we mean by design excellence at the rear of the document. Uh, uh, and on your second point, climate adaptation, um, uh, the site brief uh, is not a proposal. So the site brief, of course, is is actually a brief or to solicit a proposal and we would um, be strongly encouraging any proponents coming forward with their designs and their proposals to run the marina to, uh, to be looking at how sustainability and climate change can be adaptation can be factored into their proposals. Councillor Gross, any, that's all. Any other councillor? Councillor Brand? <clears throat> yes, I'd just like to ask a question of the officer. Similar to 
Councillor Gross's first one, um, uh, just about the sort of the dumb box approach to uh, the massing on the site that several um, several uh, uh, speakers have mentioned, including Mr. Davis, but at least three or four others, I think, or two or three others. Just the the, the principle behind what does what does on paper look like big dumb boxes. Uh, what they actually represent in terms of um, building control as opposed to the shape of the future buildings themselves. Uh, through you, Mr Chair. Uh, what is described diagrammatically in the site brief are areas where buildings may be located. Uh, that's why they appear larger than any buildings that might then be constructed on the site will be. All we're trying to do um, by, with those figure diagrams is indicate where buildings might be placed. Within the controls themselves, there's a series of parameters which describe how much each of those envelopes may be taken up with by a building on the, by an actual physical building. So for example, um, uh, with the building footprints for the dry storage, for example, um, whilst there's a, 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 large, a, a large building envelope, which is um, diagrammatically expressed in the figure, uh, the controls themselves in their specific requirements talk about uh, a maximum number of square metres and a, a maximum volume uh, that a building might possibly be within uh, the confines of that envelope. Councillors, anyone else got any questions? I'll ask one. Um, a couple of speakers spoke about penguins at the site. We love our penguins in St Kilda. Um, have we done any investigation into whether or not there are penguins located at the marina? And if so, how have we uh, treated them within this document? Uh, through you, Mr Chair. My understanding is that there uh, isn't a penguin colony there. Um, however, sorry, uh, we've always been led to understand that there's not a penguin colony at that location, um, but um, because this has been raised through the submission process, before we come back to you uh, in January with our officer responses to that, we will do another check on that. Thank you. Councillor Voss. Um, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to perhaps explore, if I could, Mr Holland's point um, about uh, a beauty par parade and whether, I know this is not probably the time, but um, whether there is an opportunity um, in the future to potentially um, have an airing of the, 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 the submitters um, for the community um, to see. Um, through you, Mr Chair, we will, we're uh, tonight considering the planning submissions, so I'll have to take that on notice and we'll provide that information to Council at the next meeting. Thank you. Councillor Sue. Thank you. There were some comments made, um, particularly by Mr Bird, but others as well, that there was no traffic study or environmental study attached to the documentation tonight. Could you please speak to that? Uh, through you, Mr Chair. Uh, so this evening, of course, we're considering um, the submissions to a planning scheme amendment, not to a proposal that's in front of us. Um, uh, when a proposal uh, is put to council as part of uh, the procurement process, uh, one of the requirements will be that it has to submit a full um, traffic analysis and study. Councillors, are there any further questions? Councillor Crawford. Uh, so there is a few references to uh, Moran Reserve um, in the submissions. I guess um, it would be great if you could explain what the thinking was about that investigation area and that it, and it's not the whole of Moran Reserve, it's just that area there and, and there's tr quite a few trees there. So it would be great if I could get an understanding of why that might be an investigation area and that it's not definitive. Is it definitive is the question. Uh, through you, Mr Chair. Um, firstly, uh, the area that's referred to in Moran Reserve forms part of the site brief, does not form part of the planning scheme amendment. So the planning scheme amendment that you're um, hearing submissions on this evening only refers to the, um, the, the lot or the, the marina lot. 
and doesn't um, actually extend to Moran Reserve. So if there were any future proposal that would consider using um, any portion of Moran Reserve, it would have to go through a whole separate planning permit process uh, of its own. Um, but to the earlier part of your question um, um, about why that is formed part of the site brief, um, uh, consideration was given to um, how we could maximise um, flexibility on the site to try and make the site as open as possible, um, both for, for users and others, and at the same time try and consolidate parking um, as much as possible. Uh, and um, it was included as a potential option for overspill parking at certain times of the year uh, if it could be justified. Was my Councillors, are there any further questions? Councillor Voss. Um, now, Mr White um, referred to the Crown Land Reserves Act and questioned um, councillors on um, whether we're prepared for a potential High Court appeal. Supreme Court, was it? Thank you, Councillor Bond. Um, because we're not following um, what that Reserve Act sort of outlines. I'm just wondering if you could speak to that. Uh, through you, Mr Chair, I'm sorry, we'll have to take that question on notice. Uh, only because it has been previously addressed through the property process and just to be consistent with that answer, I just need to touch base with my colleagues. Councillors, any further questions? No. In that case, we have a motion before us, an officer recommendation. Do I have someone prepared to move that or an alternate? Councillor Gross? Do I have a seconder? Councillor Simic? Councillor Gross, would you like to speak to the motion? Thanks very much, Comrade Chair. Um, Comrade Chair. <laughs> Sorry. So, <laughs> so to, to not, um, this is a, a very difficult, um, conceptually a difficult conversation to have because we're talking about two parallel processes. Tonight we're talking about a planning scheme amendment and then there's also a, a um, commercial process. Prior to doing anything, we had a very long, slow, deliberative consultation process with a panel of people representing the boaties, the residents and the neighbours and other stakeholders. And a couple of those people are here tonight. And that deliberative process led to a lot of really critical decisions about a couple of things. The first thing was commercialisation. How much commercial development is there going to be to sustain this um, marina? And in the end, the uh, level of commercial uh, provision was quite limited and there were proposals for more. So when some of you said that there was going to be a hotel or something, there's going to be no hotel. Um, secondly, um, there was a question about the boats and the boat users, and it was decided that this is not really going to change much about providing, or anything really, about providing facilities for boat owners to use. It's a marina now, it's going to be a marina in the future. Um, and uh, one of the third big issues was about views. Currently, the views are always, or almost always blocked. So the, um, the dry sheds uh, on the sea side of the, um, of, of the marina um, are basically an uninterrupted blockage and also you've got blockages of views on the Marine Parade that Phil talked about. And I, and the big discussion there was, if you're going to provide enough um, storage for boats, 
Do you have more gaps between the buildings to expand the opportunity for views and make the buildings higher, or do you make them lower and less um, obtrusive? So this was the big debate, and we've come down on the side of ma making them higher. You know, everyone doesn't want high buildings, um, but we made them higher to maintain the level of provision of boat facilities, but make more gaps so that there are more views to our beautiful bay. And similarly, on the marine parade, you can, can you say nod like that if I get something wrong, but on the marine parade side of the marina, there's going to be less building. And so that will, I mean, the great views are from the uh, from marine parade into the marina, and they are going to be expanded. So these are some of the dilemmas we have sought to um, resolve in both this planning process, in the consultation process, and in the commercial process. I'm sure we'll, it's going to be very hard to make everyone happy, but that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to um, make it more uh, view, viewer friendly. The other thing that's really important to talk about this is that it's not a hospitable place for pedestrians and visitors and bike riders. So the plan is to increase the level of access for pedestrians, bike riders, and in fact the, the best views are on the, say, are on the seaward side. Um, they're occupied by um, boats at the moment. These boats have the best views of the bay in, um, in, in Victoria. And it's time that those boats were replaced by people, cafes, pedestrian ways, bicycle ways, allowing people to get in and around and to try and get rid of some of the really ugly fencing that has been the hallmark of this marina. The places that I want to go to on the marina site are always locked and only available for boat owners. And I'm not a boat owner and I'm prevented from going there. So it's a large area of land. It's very complicated. It's got very difficult weather issues. So part of the good thing about those big buildings is that they are part of the windbreak that we have to provide for people who want to walk and recreate on the isthmus of the uh, marina. And protect the boats. And protect the boats. So um, I really welcome tonight's um, contribution. I've learned so much I've been forced, because we've been do, going at this process for a couple of years, I've forgotten all of the stuff that I, more than I knew. It's forced me to go back and think about these issues. Um, we've had issues um, about built form, view, view cones, um, traffic studies, public land, um, the question Councillor Crawford raised about Moran Reserve, which you know, seriously, we're all deeply concerned about. But, you know, this is another case where Council's just going through a process. We're going to have a, an expert panel advise us and there's going to be another opportunity for us to talk with you and talk with the expert, or see what the expert panel says. What Peter Holland said about the beauty parade is, I completely agree. The more we can get out to the community, subject to the rules of the Local Government Act and tender rules, the better. Otherwise, people will justifiably see us as secretive and be suspicious. So, Peter, I agree with you. You know, let's get as much stuff out there as possible. Um, Mr Richardson, can I say, you know, on, as far as I'm aware, there is going to be no great hulking hotel. Uh, we talked about that. Um, uh, Helen, on the reef protection and the adaptation, 
We are obliged under the 2008 Coastal Strategy to take climate change into account, and it will be taken into account. You have a lot of environmental nut friends on this council who won't let us get away with not taking that into account. The only thing I'd say is that if you put up a big sea wall, you've got issues with the view, and secondly, you've got issues with dissemination of wave energy it goes sideways and could then be problematic for um, other parts of the coast, like St Kilda or Elwood or Elwood Beach. So, you know, wave energy is going to be a really big thing of storm surges, and we have to take that into account. We will take it into account, but... Excuse me, sorry, this is not a chance for you to debate. So, can you resume your seat or I'll call a halt to the meeting and we'll have you removed. Excuse me, can you sit, please resume your seat or leave the room? Can you resume your seat or leave the room? If you're not going to leave the room, we'll call a halt to the meeting and have you removed. This is, this is not an opportunity for you to interrupt the meeting, this is an opportunity for councillors to vote. After the, as soon as I've finished this item. Thank you. Councillor Gross, if you could continue. So um, I'd like to finish up by saying thanks very much for all of this input. We take it seriously. We take it into account. Things you've said we all agree with. I just um, hope that we can address your um, fears as the process slowly moves through the, the panel process. Thank you, Councillor Gross. Councillor Simic, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Councillor Gross. Um, it was very thorough. It shows you've been paying attention. I'm very impressed. I note that tonight's uh, process is accepting submissions. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's come and uh, presented to us and presented submissions through this process. Uh, the uh, officers will consider all submissions and revert uh, to us on the 29th of January. Um, where we'll make a further decision on this. So tonight we're just accepting submissions and I'm really happy to support the council resolution as it's written. Thank you, Councillor Simic. Would any other councillor like to speak? Councillor Brand. <coughs> I just want to say a few words about design excellence, uh, speaking as an architect um, and having heard uh, Mr Davis's uh, words, uh, speaking as an architect as well. Um, it is. It is, it is completely crucial to Lindsay and me, and I reckon everybody else, that, it is, that this, the outcome is a really great piece of building design, not fancy pants, but something which really does the job beautifully and well. Um, what we're putting forward today is a planning scheme amendment that uh, I guess to a degree uh, sets out to contain the sort of things that we don't want and to enable the sorts of things that we do want, but not actually articulate exactly what we want. I don't think it's in the interest of design excellence for a planning scheme to actually start articulating exactly what, should be, what the design should be or not. I don't think planners and regulators are the, are the best people to decide that. Uh, in the design brief, when there's a lot more said about design excellence, it's articulated in a lot more ways, more criteria, more things to consider. It's really important that it's put out there as a, as a sort of a, a performance criterion that will be, uh, people will be judged on, but rather than as a, a formulaic, um, a, a formula for designers to follow, because again, the client, the regulator, the commissioner is not going to be as good a designer as the people we're, we're asking to design it. What we do need to ensure is that the process of um, assessment of the uh, tenders that come in, uh, that all the tenders know that they will, be, um, they will be assessed in part on the actual quality of all of their design responses right across every level of it, and that the people uh, who are doing the assessing uh, in various panels um, are briefed to do that and are capable of doing that. And it's very, very hard. Um, it's very hard to guarantee anything in that, but, as, but speaking as somebody who has been on the inside of um, so much discussion and so much uh, uh, working through the process of getting these things in place, everything we've done so far gives me faith that it is at least possible, probably likely, that we're going to have a really good result out of this. I cannot guarantee it exactly, but I 
promise you that I've kept my, this is you know, an obsession of mine too, and that I feel that we're on track to uh, doing, the, doing all we can without, the, you don't want us to do the design work ourselves to encourage you know, a really, really great uh, design outcome here. So we're putting together as many different layers of the whole process that will um, encourage, demand, these sorts of demands and all sorts of other things, functionalities and all sorts of other things too. And it's a very, very big and complicated process. Um, just on those dumb boxes, this is exactly an this is exactly an example of that. We're not suggesting that the designers come out with giant boxes and put them on the site. There, those boxes are there to contain what does get put on it. What we what we guarantee is whatever buildings that are built of all different shapes, sizes, designs, brilliance, whatever, they will fit into those boxes. That's all we're saying. And they won't be nearly as big as the boxes. The ones on Marine Parade will only be at maximum 50% of the volume of those boxes. So that's the sort of, those are how, that's how these big, bland control ideas sit with the actual finely designed outcomes. There's, there's quite a different relationship. Um, I, I hope that gives you some more confidence anyway. Thank you, Councillor Brand. Does any other councillor wish to speak? No, Councillor Gross, would you like to close? In that case, I shall put the motion. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Agenda item 6.3, 12 to 14 Duke Street, St Kilda. We have two people wishing to speak to this item. I call upon Jamie Govanlock to come down and speak to this item. Thank you, Mr. Governor. We might just wait 30 seconds for uh, these people to leave. We won't start your time yet. Mr. Governor. Thank you. Good evening, councillors. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. My name is Jamie Govanlock. I'm a town planning consultant from Urbis and I'm here um, on behalf of the applicants tonight. Um, we've reviewed the council officer's report. We are fully supportive of that report and all of the conditions contained in it. We'd like to thank the council officers for putting together such a comprehensive um, planning report. Um, effectively, to just draw the key matters of that report, uh, we're in support of the um, Council's building surveyors' um, assessment of the existing dwellings on the site, that they're badly damaged by fire and water um, and that they need to be effectively removed because those issues are insurmountable. In terms of the um, proposed dwellings on the site, uh, we in turn also agree um, with both the Council's urban design and heritage advice that the site forms part of a diverse um, heritage area, particularly that's defined by the St Kilda Library. Um, there's, a dif there's different types of architectural styles um, and little sort of character pockets within that area. This proposal will sit comfortably within that robust um, context. In relation to car parking and traffic, we also agree with Council's um, traffic engineering assessment in terms of the numbers of car parking provided comply with planning scheme requirements. There won't be any undue um, or unreasonable increase in traffic generation by this proposal. In terms of um, the Melbourne water requirements, because part of the site forms part of um, an SBO, which is the main um, drain at the rear of the site along the north boundary, we've had a number of meetings and discussions with um, Melbourne water to address a number of issues. We're very we're happy with all of the conditions that have been placed on the planning permit condition, and we'll certainly um, ad adhere to them. In terms of our interface with neighbouring um, properties, the proposal satisfies um, the uh, res code standards in terms of sort of height, shadowing, massing um, and overlooking, particularly through privacy screenings. So we think it sits comfortably within its neighbourhood. Um, in a general sense, we're supportive of what's being put forward 
by the um, in the officer's report, and uh, we thank you for your time tonight. And we hope that you follow the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, call upon Catherine Wilson. So, Councillor Brand has a question for you, if you don't mind. That's, uh, <laughs> oh, Councillor Brand, if you could ask your question. Um, I just want to put a sort of a, an idea to you. The, uh, the, the, um, one of the conditions is that uh, the applicant would uh, pay for the removal of the, pa of the palm tree at the rear. At the rear, the rear boundary. Um, and, and, and pay for its relocation and what have you. Um, I, feel, I feel very strongly that that palm tree should remain in place. For the, it's, it's, it has been one of the most extraordinary little fragments of landscape in this whole area. It's probably the most beautiful single patch of, a, of, a, of, a, of an item of landscape design, I suppose, or accident. Yes. Uh, in you know, within a kilometre of, of, of that area is really something absolutely special. And it's really tragic that it would become sort of undone, those three in a row. Um, I do understand that you are, you are under no regulatory obligation to keep that, it, whereas that is the, front, the, the front two are actually on, on council land. Yes. Would your clients, do you think, be prepared to, um, instead of paying to remove it and take it off site, actually put it in between the two existing ones? So we'd still have we'd have a slightly shortened row of three palm trees that actually uh, define that piece of landscape um, as something special. Given, my give, given that my clients are sitting behind me, I might turn around and ask them the question if that's um, okay. Is that, is that a doable proposition? Possibly. Possibly. Yeah. Look, look, look. It's it's it, it's possibly something that we could do. Um, but look, I mean, we we, we probably agree with the, what what the council officers have put forward in terms of the rear tree um, is, is not a significant element in, in, the, in the public room, whereas the first two sort of are and, and sort of clearly visible, whereas the, whereas the third tree is sort of more often, more often to the distance. So um, it's something that we could take on notice. Yeah, I mean, I clearly, I disagree with that. But I'm, ask, I'm, just, I'm, I'm not, ask, not asking you to agree yes. with that proposal now. I'm just wanting to float it yep. as a possibility. It's a possibility. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brand. Any further questions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Catherine Wilson, if you could have a seat and state your name and suburb for the record. Catherine Wilson, St Kilda. Um, thank you for the opportunity to outline my concerns about this development. Uh, Councillor Brand has actually stolen part of my thunder because my main concern is the removal of the um, Canary Island date palm at the rear of the property. Um, I actually have a photo that I took about a week ago. So there you can see this is taken from um, the, the abutting dwellings and you can see the row of trees. So clearly they are visible from the public realm um, and they, they will be vis well, if, you, if the trees remain, they'll still be visible when the, the buildings are built, if the tree remains. Um, these trees are magnificent. They are probably about 90 years old. And according to the developers, arborists are in good health, have a high arboricultural value, and have many years of useful life left. They all meet the council's significant tree criteria. Um, I was really disappointed to see the council officer who recommended that the tree be removed um, based on its small contribution to the public realm. Um, you can see it adds to the public realm. It is also visible, glimpses of it are also visible from the library, um, Lynott Street, and surrounding properties. Um, last year I listened with great interest to the council's discussion about a similar pine tree, palm tree, in Rainsford Street in Elwood. I think you probably all remember that because it was quite extensive. I looked at the Rainsford Street palm 
and suggests that all of the Duke Street Palms are far superior to the Rainsford Street Palm. So on the basis of precedent alone, um, the palm should not be removed. It was also mentioned in that case that the developer offered to remove the palm. But if I remember correctly, council rejected that offer um, and that was largely based that there was no precedent for that palm to be removed, um, for a palm to be relocated and removed and gifted to council. Um, it's, yes, it is proposed that the palm will be relocated to some other place, unspecified. I hadn't thought of Council Brand's suggestion that it be placed in the, the middle. Um, the place that I thought of perhaps was the library. And basically, the palm could not be removed anywhere else because of the difficulty that it would create in trying to transport it through the little bend in Duke Street as it goes into Martin Street. Um, a, if you had cranes, of, I don't know how you'd actually do it. And then going the other way, going to Chapel Street, you have to negotiate tram lines and, tra and all that overhead um, associated infrastructure. So I really would like the palm to remain and not be relocated anywhere. Um, Many of my actual um, issues of concern were addressed through the gestation of this project, including the consultation process, um, meeting that I had attended by Councillor Baxter. Thank you, Ms Wilson. You're at four minutes, if you could oh, come okay. to a conclusion. One last thing. Um, looking at the Council's officer's report, and this is a new thing, there is a laneway, but it's proposed to remove a crossover that goes into the laneway, which I hadn't noticed before. Um, so how can you have a laneway with no crossover into it? Um, I find that quite bizarre. So thank you for listening to my concerns. Thank you, Ms Wilson. And that concludes our speakers from the public to this item. Councillors, do you have any questions of the officers? Councillor Brand. Yes, um, I'd like to ask uh, officers uh, to um, address one or two of the things that Catherine Wilson has said. Um, that we've been uh, talking through extensively uh, before this. Um, the, st the actual status of the, of the three palm trees um, claimed, uh, which Ms Wilson has claimed, uh, all, all meet council significant tree criteria, and I fear that might not be true. What is the answer to that? Three, Mr Chair, on review, the council's arborists have noted that they are significant. Um, however, and, and have not supported the removal of them. Through Mr Chair, the original arborist comments were based on the original proposal, which was to remove all three. Um, the subsequent amended application proposes to retain two, so it wasn't considered necessary to re-refer it to them because the third tree that was to be removed was obviously still not supported to be removed. Thank you. Councillors, are there any other questions of the officers? Councillor Brand? Um, I just need that, I need that to be re-explained um, a little bit, if you wouldn't mind just unpacking. The implication is that um, council would not support the removal of that tree because it's a significant tree. Through you, Mr Chair, the Council Arborist has suggested that, um, that, that it would not be supported. However, planning officers have suggested that it would be considered acceptable to remove the rear tree and have it relocated into an appropriate location. And through you, Mr Chair, just to clarify, the trees protected under the local law and uh, not under a vegetation protection overlay, which is the planning scheme. Councillors, are there any other questions? Councillor Baxter. Sorry, can I just uh, pick up the, just the last uh, question around the crossover in the lane? 
Three, Mr Chair, the crossover leads to a laneway that basically leads into the middle of the, 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 two, the two subject sites, if you will. Um, so therefore, the, the removal of the crossover would actually result in a, an on-street car park being provided on street when there is actually no drive to, you can't drive anywhere down there as opposed to the, the subject site. So just to clarify, that laneway would cease functioning as a laneway? Uh, through Mr Chair, no it wouldn't, it would still be a laneway, um, you, however there would also be a, a, a crossover reinstated so there'd be an on-street car park. Now I'm confused. Through you, Mr Chair, the laneway doesn't lead anywhere, the laneway leads into the subject site, um, I don't know if we can get a plan up on the screen, so the, the current laneway um, doesn't actually provide access to anywhere but the subject site. So if the laneway, the laneway is to, re, is to be retained, um, the crossover to it is to be removed. Then how would you envisage cars would use that laneway? It is envisaged through you, Mr Chair, that no cars would use that laneway so because it leads into the subject site and the subject site is provided So it would be a pedestrian laneway only, not a vehicular Correct. laneway? Correct. Right. Councillors, are there any other questions? There being no further questions, um, do I have a mover for the officer's recommendation or an alternate recommendation? <laughs> Councillors, do I have a mover for the officer's recommendation or an alternate recommendation? If no one's prepared to move anything, the motion will lapse, and I'm not sure what happens then. All right, Councillor Voss, if you, we have a mover for the officer's recommendation. Do we have a seconder for the officer's recommendation? Councillor Copsey, thank you. Councillor Voss, would you like to speak to the officer's recommendation? Say no. Councillor Copsey, would you like to speak to the officer's recommendation? Well, you can move an amendment after Councillor Copsey has exercised her right to speak to this. All right. Is, would any other councillor like to speak or move an amendment? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> councillor Brand. Yeah. Um, um, I would need advice from officers on how to craft this amendment, but the, the intention of it would be to retain the third tree in its current location. Um, and I don't know how to... Uh, progress this right now without speaking to an officer. So which item or which point would you like to would move be, your amendment to? Um, it would be the one that mentions the tree. I'm sorry, I didn't think this was going to be available. Um, Numerically, which dot point would you like to move your amendment to? Is this feasible? Is this feasible to, to do? Because I don't know where to put it or how to say it. And I, it is a through, through you, um, you, Mr. Chairman. If you're going to tack it on, you would actually add it to uh, condition one. So mm -hmm. that would be um, one well, probably one I to uh, modify to show the retention of the tree. However, in looking at the plans, particularly TP202, I also need to inform councillors, I think that would be very difficult to achieve with this sort of basement arrangement. Mm. Um, I would probably recommend that your first suggestion of relocating it between the other trees, which is possible with the conditions we already have, would, I think, provide a, a similar well, outcome. Look, if it can't be done here, I will probably just go for a refusal. Thank you, Councillor Brand. If you're not going to move an amendment, um, would you still like to speak to the item? <laughs> Councillor Gross, you have a point of order? I, I just have a clarifying question. Oh, if you could ask your clarifying question. So the advice we're getting from the officers is that if you look at the back half of the property, um, the one, two, three, four elements of the building, that's got a basement configuration that prevents any tree being there. But that's, that, that stops 
with the uh, one, two, three, four elements to the front of the building. Uh, Is that correct? So, yes. So, uh, uh, Would any other councillor like to speak, Councillor Grass? Once again, I, I, I need um, the assistance of officers, but I would like to um, craft an amendment which would seek the re removal of the tree and movement towards the front. The, the relocation we've just heard. Just seeking clarification. Through, through, through you, Mr Chair. Condition uh, 19 actually talks about locating the Oh, it's on the screen. So it talks about locating the palm tree to, count, to the location to council satisfaction, and that is council, okay, yeah, council land. Sorry. And the land state is still council land. It could be located to that location. And, and I could add it would probably be easier because it's a matter of lifting the tree up and not taking it on the road at all. Yeah, that's right. So, thanks Would any other councillor like to speak? I'll speak. I was, look, I, <clears throat> I apologise for not being um, properly prepared, but I did not understand the actual status of the tree um, before I was just told that it actually is a significant tree. I thought that we had no choice whatsoever of holding it there, um, that the, that the uh, landowner could actually just uh, chop it down tomorrow, and so that it would be... Um, uh, uh, We'd be looking for creative solutions that uh, that um, circumvented that, and uh, one of them would be to actually put a you know sort of equidistant between the existing two on the council land, and that's something which is available to us. But I think, having said that, I um, think it's such a special configuration, it's such a special landscape formation that we have. To me, it is uh, something which should be which should be preserved, and I think that the uh, design should have been. Um, uh, required to work around that, um, uh, and really the building pretty much itself does work around it. It's the basement that doesn't quite, and I suppose if I, uh, if if people uh, agreed that the um, that the application should be refused on that ground, it would mean that they would have to redesign it with uh, a smaller basement, um, potentially one less unit or something like that, but it's certainly one less car park. Which I sort of, in, in which that is what I would uh, foreshadow that I would move, a, uh, a, if this was defeated, I would propose another uh, motion that would... An alternate recommendation. An alternate Councilor. recommendation that we have to come up with. Uh, but anyway, I look at. I think it's. I just think this is a very special site, and it's a. It's it's something which I'm. Uh, I'm really sad that we haven't quite managed to um, uh, preserve it the way it should have and could have been. Um, uh, so I'm going. I'm going. I'm going all out for. Uh, I think what is the best solution. But I. I, I agree that there are uh, other solutions in between, which actually do go some way to. Um, preserving something of it. Thank you. Would any other councillor like to speak? No. Councillor Voss, would you like to close the debate? Yep. Councillor Baxter would like to speak. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, look, I uh, just wanted to um, uh, thank those that came to speak. Uh, I um, it was at the, uh, the, the consult uh, quite a while back talking about this, and I do think that um, there were quite a lot of uh, concerns put forward by residents, but very little of it was about the actual quality of the, the, the buildings and the dwellings themselves. I think most people were relatively happy about that. The concerns were generally around parking, they were around the retention of the tree um, and, uh, and, and some other things. And some people may have had some genuine concerns about the buildings as well, but certainly the vibe I got was um, uh, less about that and more about how... It, it seemed like a really constructive con uh, uh, discussion uh, with people about what is the best thing we could get there, um, rather than uh, you know ob ob objecting to um, design or something like that. Um, so I think that uh, I think that where we've ended up here is pretty close. 
um, to the, the the best outcome you could sort of get on that site. Um, like uh, like Councillor Brand, I wish there were more options for retention of the third tree, but um, one thing I know is the good thing about these types of um, palms is that you that they are relatively easily transplantable um, compared to other trees uh, in, in terms of the type of tree that they are. And so I hope that there's a good home that can be found for that that will continue to complement the area. So um, I think that's where we're at. Thank you, Councillor Baxter. Any other councillor wish to speak? Councillor Voss would like to close. That case said, I, I put the motion. All those in favour? All those against? That motion is carried. Item 6.4, Statutory Planning Delegation Decisions Report for November 2019. We have no speakers to this item. Are there any questions from councillors of officers? Councillor Pearl wishes to move. Councillor Voss will second. Um, Councillor Voss, would you like to speak? Would any other councillor like to speak? In that case, all those in favour? That is carried unanimously. Item 6.5, P773-2018, 46, 48 and 50 to 58, Marlborough Street, Balaclava. We have nine speakers to this particular item. I'd like to call upon Michael Dunn as our first speaker. Michael, if you could come to the uh, microphone, state your name and suburb. Clive Bowden from Housing First. Um, so good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I just want to start by stating a simple but I believe a very salient fact. Um, there are currently over 50,000 people waiting on the Victorian Housing Register. The social housing wait list for a, uh, social housing wait list for a safe place to live that people can afford. I wanted you to know this statistic um, to create some context. 50,000 Victorians waiting for somewhere decent and affordable to call home, many of them older people. So what we're asking to be considered here tonight is how all of us can actually do something to help address the current and frankly disastrous undersupply of affordable housing in our community in Port Phillip through this development project, the origins of which go back well before my time and yours. Back to a group of people who probably much like all of us here were passionate about living in the city of Port Phillip, who were bold enough to create the Port Phillip Housing Trust exactly for this purpose, and who nearly 20 years ago were again bold enough to identify this Marlborough Street site as the perfect place for people to make their home. This project is our joint opportunity, our joint legacy, if you like, to fulfill the vision of those who came before us, and who again, like most of us here, I believe, wanted to do the right thing to create homes and futures for 46 Port Phillip residents in need and their families. <clears throat> to give these people some of the same chances that hopefully we've had, a safe, stable home close to everything they need where they can live a better life. Permanent, quality, affordable, safe homes in a friendly and accepting community. Today we're being asked to step up and fulfill the bold vision of those who came before us who would have sat in meetings just like this over the years and to support a housing project that will have a major, positive, long-lasting impact on the lives of so many people, long after all of us are gone as well. To give future generations the chance and privilege to liz live as we have raised families, work and grow old amongst friends in the city of Port Phillip. We have undergone a detailed 12-month planning review process through all the proper channels. Changes have been made, the process has been a long one, but of course it's an important one we wanted to get right. So tonight we would ask you again to be bold. We ask you that you allow us to build these 46 good quality, modern, sustainable dwellings in the place that was earmarked by your predecessors for this exact purpose nearly 20 years ago. And to welcome 46 deserving residents and their families into this vibrant community with open arms. Thank you. 
Uh, good evening, Michael Dunn from Metropole Planning Solutions, a planning consultant. I'll just talk very briefly to the, uh, the planning controls that apply to this site. Uh, we um, commend the officer's report to the council. Uh, it's, it, as uh, Clive has mentioned, it's been a 12-month process uh, and that really reflects the level of scrutiny that has been applied to the, to the design that was put forward. Uh, it, I think it was 12 months before we actually got to the advertising stage and that was a result of uh, a heavy a degree of scrutin, uh, scrutiny by various council departments, urban design uh, and, and town planning uh, particularly. Um, this is really the, um, the, the um, culmination, I guess, of a designation of the site in 2009 in council structure plan and urban design framework uh, for this site as a, an affordable housing uh, opportunity. Um, as uh, as uh, Mr Bowden's explained, it's a, it is a significant opportunity in terms of providing affordable housing. Um, the impacts on the neighbours uh, are very much um, mitigated by the built form controls that apply. This is a, a, an unusual site uh, in that it has very specific planning controls, very specific building envelope uh, that ensures that the building essentially presents as three storeys to Marlborough Street uh, with very uh, recessive and, and hidden upper levels uh, as it's, as it's uh, perceived from the south side of Marlborough Street. So um, the, the design, uh, and it's reflected in the officer's report, uh, does not result in any unreasonable impacts on, on neighbours. Uh, it's consistent with the mixed use zoning uh, and it's, a, it's in keeping with uh, the opportunity that a site right next to a railway station uh, presents. Uh, it's not affected by heritage overlay uh, and uh, it, it clearly is earmarked for, for, this, for this envelope and for this, uh, for this use. Uh, so we um, commend the officer's report to Council. Thank you very much. Um, call upon Travis Walton as the next speaker. Travis, if you could state your name and suburb for the record. Just hit the button on the mic. Sorry. Uh, my name is Travis Walton. I'm a resident of Marber Street and a practicing architect uh, with my own practice. Um, the site is affected by a design development overlay schedule 21. The design proposal is inconsistent and unresponsive to the design directions and aspirations of the overlay as it does not appropriately activate frontages particularly to the laneway interface to the north. It does not respectfully graduate to the lower density to the west nor adopt the fine grain nature and period styling of, of the existing dwellings fronting to Marble Street. It exceeds the mandatory height requirements without sufficient justification of over overarching design controls or respect to the heritage overlay on the south. It encroaches into the setbacks necessary to protect the character and amenity of the surrounding area. It does not respond positively to the built character form. It poorly responds to the public realm and pedestrian environment. The proposal greatly exceeds the mandatory requirements of DD 021 to a degree that should not result in variations to any other aspect of the development controls. However, has imposed and overstated the proposal's overdevelopment by asking for variations to res code standards. Standards D10, landscaping, standard D19, private open space objective, standard D24, functional layout objective. It is unacceptable and unreasonable to make such variations when the overlay's preferred development envelope is almost doubled. The report fails to mention the internal environmental quality of ground floor south facing dwellings when no solar access will be received at any time of day. Further, the overhang and depth of the dwellings raise concern on the amenity provided for future occupants. The proposal is supported by consultant documentation that is incomplete that themselves suggest unacceptable outcomes. The proposal portrays a hastily contrived design response with insufficient information that tips the balance to yield rather than an acceptable outcome. Based on the above, I do question the council officer's ability to objectively obsess this proposal against its own planning policy. The issues of non-compliance cannot be addressed by way of condition, and I think the councillors should not support the current proposal and refuse it. The design as it stands does not meet the, the City of Port Phillip's design excellence agenda, which has been set up by such programs as the Design and Development Awards. These awards honour the best projects across Melbourne's inner south suburbs, including Albert Park, St Kilda, Balclava and Elwood. 
Shelley Penn, architect and former national president of the Australian Institute of Architects, recently chaired that panel. She was joined by Monique Woodward of Wawawa, who was also co-creative director of the 2019 National Architecture Conference and winner of the 2018 National Emerging Architect Prize. James Leggy, founding director of Six Degrees, also sat on the panel. Six Degrees won two awards in the program in 2017. Mayor Dick Grass and councillors Bernadine Voss and David Brand also sat on this panel. Mayor Bernadine Voss said, this year's Design Week theme, Design Effects, recognises the importance of design excellence and throughout development in, de in balancing growth and maintaining the unique character of diverse and distinctive neighbourhoods. I can't think of a more relevant theme for Port, Port Phillip as we're proud of our much loved neighbourhoods and have pledged in a long term vision to do the utmost to keep our city's character as Port Phillip continues to grow. I personally agree with the above and give praise to the efforts that the City of Port Phillip and its councillors have achieved in many great projects in recent years. These projects include Housing First for 87 Chapel Street in 2012, which was winner of a Dulux Colour Award in 2013 for multi residential. Housing First for Woodstock Rooming House, a 31-unit room, rooming house, where the architect said the external design reflects the streetscape, transition from commercial use of Woodstock Street to domestic use in Marlborough Street. The building recognises two main building types represented in this area, the single-storey Victorian weatherboard cottage and a two-storey brick warehouse shop. While the built form relates to the relatively recent context, the area's early history as a career meeting place is referred to in the patterning of the brickwork, an integrated art collaboration between Indigenous artist Ben McCowan and MGS, who I believe is a local resident as well. Thank you, Mr Walton. You've had over four minutes. If you could come to the conclusion. Sure. The Marble Street housing project deserves to be an award-winning piece of architecture. The residents of social and affordable housing deserve this. The residents and the community around the site deserve this. The project as it stands will not achieve the design ex excellence of City of Port Phillip and as a result I suggest that in its current form will end up in VCAT. I ask councillors to please carefully consider the scale and height of the building and to comprehensively review the architecture articulation of the Marble Street interface. I previously requested 3D views of the proposal from both the sides of the street at street level, not axonometric. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walton. So, Councillor Brands has got one question for you. You mentioned three um, provisions under, I'm not quite sure, but there was D24 and two before D19. And yes. just, there were three, I think, that you mentioned? Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Space. Yeah, so the uh, standard D10 landscaping, uh, D19 private open space objective, D24 functional layout objective, uh, but the comments were uh, in reference were the south facing apartments. The south facing apartments, okay. Which I think is standard B29 off the top of my head. Thank, thank you, Mr. Walton. Was there any further questions? All right. I call upon Peter Dewey. Mr. Dewey, if you just state your name and suburb for the record. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Chair. Um, so if you could just have a seat so we can okay. put yourself close to the microphone so we can all hear you. Right. I'm, I'm here with uh, Housing First, and I have nothing that I can add to the excellent statements made by Clive Bowden and uh, Michael Dunn. Then I will thank you for your comments. Um, I'll call upon Sophie Ryan. Thank you, Ms Ryan. If you could just state your name and suburb for the record. Um, Sophie Ryan, um, living in Montalbert currently and hopefully in about 12 months' time we'll finally make it to Rosemont Street after some ordeals on site with the building, our building being built. Oh, forgive me, um, I wasn't... A few more. So I wrote more concerns um, in the written objection to Council, um, and tonight, conscious of the three minutes, was just going to make a few comments. Um, the first one was 
really to reiterate, um, just after reading some of the material that's available online um, from the council, um, which talks about um, in the planning process persons opposed to community housing. Um, just really want to reiterate, it, um, make clear tonight that um, my objection is definitely not falling into this category. Um, equally, where the same um, presentation referred to um, or called council um, members to show leadership and resilience almost in the face of objections to achieve outcomes. Um, just really want to make it clear that um, this is not an objection to community housing. Um, I've worked for the last six years um, in a not-for-profit organisation working very hard on um, the design framework for SDA housing and um, initially I was very excited when I heard that there would be SDA um, dwellings very close to where I'd be living. Um, However, um, when looking then at the design, um, I no longer feel that way. Um, really, so the site's rareness and also the very good need for the, um, pro for the proposed use, they are as they are, but they don't justify um, the design so detrimentally impacting on neighbours, um, particularly where the issues can be avoided just with some sensitive design. It is possible to provide more housing while also considering the neighbouring context. Um, I was curious just to see how the proposed development sat in its context and hence on the third sheet there's a site sh section showing um, the majority of one to two storey dwellings around the development and how the development sits so much higher than this. Um, the second section shows, um, so a person in from the middle of our living spaces, um, which have all been oriented north to um, take, which, yeah, um, and you can see from the view cone that um, in both the two townhouses, the um, views from the living spaces will be dominated by the proposed development. Um, and on the second, the next page after that, you'll see just a, just a diagram of the um, footprint of the proposed development and how much larger it is um, in proportion than the fine grain dwellings um, from Marlborough Street and Rosemont Street um, to the south. Um, so the proposed massing and height will block the majority of visual access to the sky and this condition is not just over the width of a standard block which would still allow side views to the sky but over the equivalent of six standard blocks. This is a significant change in the skyline resulting from the addition of only one development. The six dwellings directly facing the proposed development on Marlboro Street being 45 to 55 will suffer even greater loss of amenity than, than we will due to being more closely positioned. Because uh, of the sheer thank you, Ms Ryan. You've had close to four minutes, or over four minutes, if you could come to the conclusion. Because of the sheer height of the proposed, um, it, surely some visual break would be appropriate just to permit small dwellings to still view the sky, which is a characteristic feature of the area. Surely there should be some articulation at lower ground, uh, as there has been at lower ground levels, up at higher levels, given how vis visible it is from property set back further. Um, and because it is so visible to other dwellings, surely the attention to materials should also be applied to these upper levels as well, if it does need to be so high, rather than just re resorting to blank concrete panels, which are quite, have, um, doesn't integrate with the surrounds at all. Um, just agreeing with um, Travis previously, it's a landmark site and it's a very important brief. I can't say best practice in the design. And just the last two sheets I'd showed there, um, the SDA apartment layout which is presented there. Um, I can't see that there's a direct link from the bathroom to the bedroom, which I might have got it wrong. Perhaps I'm looking at the wrong layout for the SDA one, but um, where I worked, that was the best. You did that for all the SDA dwellings, high physical support. 
gives people dignity to, so you can have a direct transfer. If you have people out in your living room, you, you get undressed in your bedroom, you get into your commode, you moved across into the bathroom. If you're next to naked, um, there's no dignity being transferred that way. You're meant to have a direct link from your bedroom to the bathroom. That doesn't seem to be provided. I might be wrong. Maybe the design's changed. Um, it'd be great if it has, but uh, that doesn't seem to be uh, best practice. Th thank you, Ms Ryan. Um, Councillor Pell has one question for you. Thank you so much for coming this evening. I'm just wondering, I'm concerned by the first two pages you gave us in your pack here. Yep. Uh, where did they come from? Um, it says on the second... So it says it's been written by a council officer, Housing Development Officer, May 2012. But where did you get these from? Are uh, these on the website or...? Correct, yep. I can send the follow-up link. No, that's fine. It's, um, I appreciate you bringing it to our attention. Uh, Councillor Gross has a question for you. Sorry, Sophie. That um, third page, that's that um, elevation, is, is that from the officer's report or you...? The site sections. Yeah. I just prepared them because I was curious. We haven't seen any site sections. And the, in the um, response provided from the applicant back to um, uh, Catherine, um, the comments kept coming up saying that no one can... It doesn't matter about the materials because no one can see it. But you can see it. Um, so that section... I, I've been misled by sections before. Sometimes they're through the low part of the building, sometimes they're through the high part. This is a section through the... This is a section from the first floor where all of our living spaces are rented. So it's a de deliberate design choice to maximise sole access um, and views to the existing car park, which was of trees and sky. Um, we made it just... Yeah, that was the... Yeah. And I, I suggest that other dwellings along the row who also want to extend with the first floor addition would want to orient north as well. Um, I'd just show you that to show that it is visible. It's quite visible. And because we have the privacy screening all the way around, that means the view cone is limited from there oh. upwards. It's nice if you can so. Thank you, Ms Ryan. Uh, I'll call upon Alison Ryan if you could come to the microphone and state your name and suburb for the record. Good evening, my name's Alison Ryan, uh, currently living in Mont Albert, but I will be an owner at uh, Rosamond Street in Balaclava. Um, dear councillors and all in attendance, my objection regards the improportionate scale of the proposed development in its height and mass in relationship to neighbouring railway station and residential dwellings on Marlborough Street and southwards. Um, the architect would have made good illustration of this point had a model been made to show heights and mass. On the Victorian Government Planning website, the Activity Centre Pilot Program Key Findings Report, page 11 states, height controls are acceptable as a mechanism to ensure that neighbourhood character or heritage is respected. On page 20 it states, to ensure proper regard is afforded to all two off-site impacts, stronger and measurable definitions of the key amenity impacts should be prepared. These should tailor to surrounding environments and local context. I object that this proposal is overly prominent compared to the existing built form character and will impact neighbours by blocking sky views, alter wind currents and spoil visual amenity for neighbours. Regarding concern for people's safety and proper use of the railway station access walkway, the proposed common cafe area abutting the access pathway should be removed. The access path has a purpose to direct travellers. 
to change the nature of the use of the pathway for socialisation, abutting the railway station should not be allowed. Already a police presence has been called for on Carlisle Street and police currently patrol the railway station. It would be a very negative effect upon the community if police started to patrol the walkway too. I have submitted a paper, which could you please put up on the screen? Uh, the Victorian government, local government and local councils have new laws and policies which are being implemented under a globalised United Nations scheme called the New Urban Agenda, which is designed to settle people more densely into existing suburbs in new infrastructure. Obviously, this scheme affects the land, the means of production and consumption, and existing ways of life which have provided enjoyment and prosperity for people for decades. A strong feature, and I had another one to link, that this is United Nations, despite that report not saying so. Uh, Ms. Um, Ryan, I'm going to ask you to come back to the specifics of the development will, before it's I will, a, a, planning, a planning meeting, so we need to be very specific that we're talking to the development. It's very, that's true, but may I respectfully suggest that I am bringing in a perspective which addresses why. And this is very, very important for our understanding. I could say more about so that. You're, you're close to four minutes, if you could very well, quickly I, I wrap up. I did time it initially. It was only three minutes, of 15, three minutes and 15 seconds, but anyway, I have been put off track a little bit. Okay. A strong feature of the United Nations new economic model wants to decouple resource use from economic growth and to direct economic activities to poverty eradication and social development. Such redistribution, however, is really to save the earth and to force and lock people under its principles in and for whatever we do. The individual citizen doesn't have a say in the public-private partnerships for the new resource economy and the role of local councils away from their traditional roles to following the goals of the United Nations leaves the local residents without much say in their own communities. Indeed. If you take a good look at the monument erected after the 1991 Town Hall fire, you will notice that rising from the ashes, there is a new... Ms Ryan, I'm going to finish it there. You've had close to five minutes and I think you've wandered off the topic I, at hand. I, so I, I, this is my last... It's, if you could finish that sentence, that would be wonderful. OK, I haven't quite finished it. There is a new man content to rest in the group of serpents. At the bottom is an ancient building, much like the United Nations logo for its own UNESCO, United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organisation, with aeroplane overhead, thus depicting the patron for the town hall as the universal... Th thank you, Ms Ryan. If you could just conclude there, that would be... Thank you. Right. You've had five and a half minutes, so I think we're at the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. I just wish, in my conclusion, um, that all the points I've mentioned and objected to have the effect of spoiling our suburbs. I urge our council to amend the proposal to give respect to the neighbourhood character and amenity. Thank you. Th thank you very much for your thorough presentation. I call upon Ms Rhonda Small. Thank you, Ms. Small. If you could state your name and suburb for the record. Thank you, Chair and Councillors. My name's Rhonda Small, uh, St Kilda. I think tonight's a really exciting time on this proposal, which has been, as has been commented, almost 20 years in the making. I'm a long-term resident of St Kilda and a long-term supporter of this Council's commitment to building community and social housing. So I think it's... Um, the next step in this uh, process for Marlborough Street to um, support this um, planning permit and I really look forward to all of you supporting the officer's recommendations. I also want to say, and many of you will know, that yesterday Housing First was awarded $72 million of financing 
from the National Housing uh, Financing and uh, Investment Corporation funding. And a, a previous speaker has already spoken about the awards that Housing First has won for properties in uh, the city of Port Phillip. So it does not concern me that this property will um, in fact have all the kinds of design features and excellence that we expect. And the other day I was down at Kyme Place in Port Melbourne and I remember when that proposal was going through council and this was another car park, um, use of a car park in turning into to community housing and it still looks stunning, that development and I expect that what will happen at Marlborough Street is that once it's built and once the landscaping and the cafe, and I disagree with the previous speaker, I think the cafe on the ground floor will be wonderful, we will actually find that this settles into its location and is a wonderful resource for those who live there and for the local neighbourhood. I did have just a couple of questions, though, about the officer's recommendation. Um, it's a bit unclear. Uh, the applicant, Housing First, is asked to um, provide a car park management plan, uh, which I found a little curious because, as I understand it, it's council that retains the management of the car park. So I just have a question which I hope one of the councillors will take up. Um, to confirmation that it is council that will manage the car park and therefore is it not council's role to provide the management plan for the car park. Secondly, I wondered whether it's standard for a building of this height to um, have a wind assessment uh, required. Uh, I wouldn't have thought it was necessary for a building of this height but perhaps I'm wrong in that regard. And the urban art proposal I think sounds lovely, but again, is this a common requirement for um, either Housing First or any other to require this um, uh, sort of proposal and is this something that the Council will work in partnership with Housing First to achieve to get the best outcome for the community? Thank you. Thank you, Ms Small. I call upon Michael Ryan, if you could come down to the microphone and state your name and suburb for the record. Press the button, turn it on. Yeah, my name's Michael Ryan. Our family's trying to build in Rosamond Street, looking, as my daughter said, straight at six floors. Um, look, I was woken up this morning at 3.11am um, with the following words pounding in my head. Is it fair? I then jotted down a few of the following thoughts. Is it fair for council to consider supporting a proposal when 100% of the residents I've spoken to oppose it in its current format? Is it fair to call a public meeting and then largely ignore the comments made? Is it fair to ignore the lessons from the existing Marlborough Street community housing development of 31 rooms in the same street 90 metres away, which I believe was significantly modified following extensive community feedback. That appears to have been all that lessons and learnings ignored. Is it fair to consider further community housing in Marlborough Street while existing residents are still having problems with the first community housing project? Is it fair to make the residents go through all of that again when some are still seeding from the previous experience? Is it fair to increase the proportion of community dwellings from an existing 55% in the street to 76% when the council has identified in its own documents hundreds of other potential sites for community housing? Is it fair to inundate and saturate one little narrow dead-end street with one type of housing? Is it fair to simply limit an assessment of the visual appearance of a building from one spot across the footpath in Marlborough Street when we are talking about potentially the tallest building in Balaclava which will be seen for kilometres? 
Is it fair to design a building which in many ways is very similar to the Melbourne Assessment Prison in Spencer Street, which was designed to keep its residents, including Archbishop Pell, in solitary confinement, safe, secure, with the ability to communicate... Mr Wright, I'm going to interrupt you there. I'm asking, can you speak to the specifics of the development in front of us and not wander off to other areas that are not particularly certainly. relevant to this application? Certainly. Can only communicate internally. Is it fair to call this proposal a genuine community housing at all? Is it fair to not show my objection as a dot on the map you've been given, the objectors map, I'm not shown as a dot, simply because I, I didn't use my address there, it was an address outside the zone. Is that fair? Is it fair to ask emergency services such as police, ambulance, doctors, fire brigades, with their critical response times and performance measures, to have to back up whenever they visit Marlborough Street for either residential or station emergencies? Is it fair to locate near a railway station, we all want to be near a railway station, rather than this shows it integrated into a railway station? Is it fair on anyone to have not one millimetre gap between community housing and a super railway station where thousands of passengers pass by daily? Is it fair to take people who may have to unfortunately sleep under railway bridges to get away from noise, vibration and lights and to deliberately in a planned way accommodate them in accommodation which overlooks a railway station with regular train noise, lights 24-7 and subject to observation by increasingly large numbers of the diversified train users. Is it fair to look at this proposal as simply an exercise to maximise the number of community housing units on the site while ignoring the genuine welfare of future occupants, the local traders present and future, the metro business and its thousands of train users and the significant impact it will have on the immunity of the abutting residential zone. Thank you, Mr Ryan. You've had over four minutes. If you could just conclude your comments. Thank you. With you. Is it fair and wise to simply limit the height of the proposal to two levels, thus eliminating most of the objections, therefore giving it some chance of success from the start, rather than building it higher than two levels and creating a raft of major problems and giving it absolutely no chance whatsoever of success. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr Ryan. I call upon Helen Halliday, if you could come down and take a seat and state your name and suburb for the record. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bond. Uh, my name's Helen Halliday. Uh, I live at 2 Albion Street. Um, generally, I just wish to express my support for the proposal. Um, it's been a long time coming, and I think um, it's terrific to see some social housing hopefully uh, added to for the house uh, for City of Port Phillip. Um, my uh, only question really is in relation to the public realm plan. Um, what I would like to see added there is that um, the pu public health realm plan is uh, proposing work to be done on the Balaclava Walk. Uh, we all know that the uh, Balaclava Walk is a travesty of design and it provides an opportunity for um, some improvements. And um, that being the case, I would hope that the council would consider um, that the, a, a revised walk be as was originally envisaged before all the grey paint was, or all the grey cement was sprayed onto it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Halliday. And uh, that concludes our members of the public speaking this evening. Councillors, do we have any questions of the officers? Councillor Brandt. <coughs> Just on the last point raised by Ms Halliday, um, the cafe public uh, space area that's proposed here has landscaping in it, and I'm just wondering what opportunity there is to coordinate that with landscaping of the of the uh, Balaclava Walk landscape altogether. Is that sort of is the timing wrong, or is it, is it something which could be a happy um, collaboration or? Um, 
just wondering if there are opportunities there to actually uh, help plan the landscaping um, in collaboration with other things that are going on there. Um, thank you. Through you, Mr Chair, um, the design and development overlay which applies to this site calls for a four metre setback of any building from the eastern boundary to provide a walkway adjacent to the train station. Um, and that's annotated as Balaclava Walk on the, on the ground floor plans that we have. Um, now, there is a requirement in the conditions, recommended condition 27, um, requires a public realm plan to be prepared for endorsement. That is a plan that would have to be prepared in consultation with council um, to deal with um, the Balaclava Walk as it exists within the subject site only. Um, so that would deal with landscaping treatments, paving, etc., um, but only to the extent that it is within um, this site that we're considering. So the scope of works outside of the site, um, I mean, they're beyond what this planning permit can control unless they're directly related to the application at hand. Thank you. Through you, Mr Chair, if I could add to that um, what Ms Rawling said is correct. We, are, we have just completed our consultations on the public space strategy and that's been considered. So open space in the public realm will be um, reviewed and opportunities to improve it will be identified and presented to councillors at a later date. And we have also organised a meeting with Ms Halliday to consider um, the comments that she's made this evening regarding use of public open space. Thank you, Ms. Rosie. Councillor Simic. Uh, thank you. I'd like to take on Ms. Rhonda Small's questions, and there were three parts to her question one around car park management plan uh, and whether this is a common requirement, wind assessment required for bu building of the site, whether that's a common requirement, uh, and the urban art proposal if this is a common requirement and whether Council could collaborate with Housing First on this. Thank you. Through you, Mr Chair. So obviously this is a unique proposal in that Council owns the land. Um, however, there is an agreement um, in place with an, in fact, an affordable housing provider to potentially deliver on an affordable housing outcome subject to a planning permit being granted. Um, so it is an unusual situation in that um, the proposal we have before us includes components that would re remain with Council and components that would go to Housing First to manage. The car park would remain with Council to manage. Um, the planning permit, however, deals with the application in its entirety. So the planning permit, therefore, includes conditions related to both the, the Housing First component and the Council component. So. Um, the car park management plan requirement um, requires extensive details about how the car park will be managed into the future. Um, a large part of that has come about in response to concerns um, raised by nearby residents, having some degree of uncertainty as to how that will operate, as well as being relevant to the planning permit trigger where the use of the land for a car park does require a planning permit. In terms of who will carry out the requirements of the condition, which is to prepare a management plan, um, whether that falls to a Housing First or Council is something that will need to be resolved between those two parties, and that's Council as land manager, not Council as responsible authority here today. As they move, if this is granted a permit, when they move forward with with the proposed with the development. Thank you, um, Council Semi. If I can just follow up on the wind assessment as well. Thank you. Through you, Mr Chair, the wind assessment requirement is fairly standard for a larger scale development. So generally we wouldn't include it on something three to four storeys height. Once we get higher than that, we would look at including it, um, especially because there is a public walkway component to this along the east boundary Balaclava Walk. So we want to make sure that residential amenity there wouldn't be adversely impacted by wind. So the actual condition itself doesn't necessarily mean there has to be a huge report because it will be commensurate to the scale of this development. So it is reasonably standard requirement for a larger scale development. 
and then also to move on to the urban art contribution condition. Now that is a standard requirement as well. It's a standard condition. Again, it's commensurate for to the scale of the development. So we apply it for um, developments that are four storeys or more in height, and that's under our local policy at Clause 2206, which includes a number of design objectives, including urban art. So that's a standard condition. And again, in terms of who provides the urban art, I think that's a question that needs to be resolved by um, the parties. And again, that's council as land manager, not council as the responsible authority in the future if this permit is granted. Thank you. Councillor Crawford. I guess I've got two questions. One, under the planning scheme, is anyone's view protected? Like we actually can't, can, it, can we protect views or is it only sunlight access? And the second question is, um, the space that is uh, designated for a use of shop or whatever, um, I, I am concerned that we have many shops that retail is not what it used to. Is that space able under this permit to be turned into a community room or turned into housing if you know, it's a, a not necessarily a viable space for that, and we've got lots of coffee shops around that we, you know, want to support. So I guess I'm, is that space under this planning permit able to be utilised in a different way, or would the plan, uh, future have to be amended? Um, thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. I might address the second question first. Um, so the proposal includes a shop that's 120 square metres on the eastern side. It, the layout is. Um, it's an empty canvas which would provide potentially for some adaptability to other uses in the future. A shop does not need a planning permit in the mixed use zone, so we're not really in a position under this application to control that use. However, in the mixed use zone, some uses do require a planning permit, so it really depends on what happens in the future. But if this were to go ahead, um, then I think if, if there was trouble finding a tenant, it would be potentially open to them to um, reuse the space for another use. Whether that use needs a planning permit or not, um, that will be separate, have to be dealt with at that time. But the, the layout certainly provides some flexibility um, for that um, outcome in the future. And, and I apologise, I've forgotten the first question. Uh, can, is it a planning matter, do you consider view, or is it just access to sunlight that you have to um, consider? Thank you. Through you, Mr Chair. Um, there are some, as, some particular views that are protected within the City of Port Phillip, but they're of specific landmarks, um, some bay views, so they're, they're specifically, uh, they're actually mentioned in the planning scheme. There's no particular landmarks or views or vista that in this particular area that is protected in the planning scheme. Um, so the loss of views as a concept um, uh, from a neighbouring property would be more dealt with under requirements in relation to daylight, to windows and visual bulk, which certainly do form part of our assessment. Thank you. Councillor Gross. Uh, thanks, Mr Chair. Um, I just want to um, take up some of the issues of uh, Travis and Sophie. So, um, Travis made the point that um, there's a fine grain urban character there and this seems to be a diversion away from that urban character. Um, let's start with that one first. Thank you. Through you, Mr Chair. Um, both our urban designers and, and the, we as the plan, uh, myself as the planner, I'm comfortable that the design response achieves a um, articulated response to um, the area. This is a unique site in that it is somewhat of a bookend um, adjacent to the train station on one side, commercial properties to the north, and then you have the finer grain dwellings to the east, so to the west and south. Um, and uh, again, going to the design specifically, it has sought to incorporate. Um, I'll just go to the um, the street elevation plan, the south elevation, which is the elevation to Marlborough Street, incorpor incorporates a number of elements to um, break up both horizontally and vertically the building. It's not trying to hide from being a larger building, but I think in our view it, it, in, it does enough to incorporate that <coughs> vertical 
and horizontal um, articulation through the use of different materials, um, the setbacks, the use of colours, um, window fenestration, etc. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. That's useful. Um, the height controls are complicated. We've got four storeys and then two well set back store, uh, storeys on top, so making six storeys. What is the current provision in the uh, site specific rules about height? Because they're a bit tricky. Thank you, through you, Mr Chair. That, that's correct. They are a little complicated. The design and development overlay incorporates both mandatory and discretionary controls. The height limit is a preferred height limit of four storeys or 13 metres, so it's not mandatory. However, there are other mandatory requirements which do have an impact on height, one of those being a mandatory requirement to achieve a sight line so that the building will not be visible when viewed from the opposite side of Marlborough Street. That is a mandatory control. However, the design of the fifth and sixth storeys in this case would have been set back into the northeast corner of the site so that they would meet that mandatory control. So that they're not not visible. That's correct. And and sight lines have uh, through you, Mr Chair have been um, provided which show that. Great. Um, there was the question of the um, we might have covered this. Um, the solar um, the solar accessibility of the south facing units. Thank you. Through you, Mr Chair, there are some requirements, particularly in Clause 58, which do talk about orientation of dwellings. A northern orientation is generally encouraged for being the better one in terms of direct um, sunlight access. However, overall, um, with this proposal, there has been a balancing of a number of different factors, and that has resulted in some dwellings having a southern orientation, but that is offset by the fact that in having either a northern or southern orientation on this site means that you don't need to use screening, which will prohibit outlook and views. So there's a payoff in terms of having an outlook either over the street or um, to the to, um, right. commercial properties. Um, and um, yeah, so that, that's probably one of the key factors when you look at a site, you have to look at the orientation as well. So this site being oriented um, with the, in the long direction east to west also means you're going to have more properties that are south facing than if you had a, a longer property north to south, if that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for your extraordinary knowledge, encyclopedic knowledge of the um, design development overlay. Um, the design excellence was raised by Mr Walton. Are we in a position in this forum to talk about that issue? Um, how do we resolve that allegation? What's your advice on that? Thank you. Through you, Mr Chair, under the planning scheme and the relevant controls for this site, design excellence is not a test that must be um, passed. Um, there are some specific site controls within the municipality that do mention in some cases design excellence, but that's quite limited and that's not the case here. Rather, we apply our um, normal sta uh, requirements for um, urban design, which are set out in our policy, particularly at Clause 2206, as well as in this DDO, which seek for certain other attributes to be met, such as activation of the laneway um, so, and activation of Balaclava Walk, etc. Um, which would be achieved here and ultimately in, in this case the test from a purely planning perspective is whether it's a reasonable outcome. So that's um, not the same thing as design excellence from our point of view but I will make the point that our urban designer was um, supportive of this pro proposal um, subject to some relatively minor conditions which have been included in the recommendation. Thank you. Thanks, that's a great answer and I've just wanted to pick up some of Sophie's points because I thought she gave a great presentation. Um, I think we've talked about the height of the surrounding built form but her... So I don't think we need to go into that because you've already answered. Is there a question, uh, Councillor Gross? Um, yeah. Uh, what, 
What about you, the um, second half? Have you got her thing, the impact on access to the sky? Um, what's your advice on whether that is compliant with the design development overlay or not? Or um, is it not a factor that we can take into account? Uh, thank you, through you, Mr Chair. The, I think what has been tabled here does show that the building would be visible from their property, so that that is not um, disputed. There is no control in this site in relation to not being visible from longer distance views in any direction, so its visibility isn't the particular consideration, rather it's design resolution overall in response to the site-specific controls are. so. Um, and I previously discussed views as well, so this building also wouldn't be precluding any views of specifically designated sites. Um, so the culmination of those things um, means that this proposal would, would comply with the relevant controls, despite being visible when viewed from other properties, other residential properties nearby. Great. Thanks very much. Councillor Poss. Thank you. I'd just like to ask um, Ms Pound another question that um, Ms Ryden sort of raised, and that was around uh, the possible requirement to have uh, a NDIS specialist disability accommodation um, layout. I'm just a bit curious about that because I haven't really seen it before, although I understand where she's coming from, um, that uh, the bathroom really should be close to the bedroom and not go through a kitchen. Is that a requirement for this particular application? Um, I'm actually not even sure if this layout is from this application, but just wondering if you could um, comment on that, please. Thank you. Through you, Mr Chair. Um, under the planning scheme in Clause 58, there is a specific standard which relates to accessibility objectives. It has very specific requirements in relation to the design and layout of bedrooms, bathrooms and how um, the bathrooms are laid out. Um, under the standard only, or at least I should say 50% of dwellings need to meet those standards, so there's some flexibility in terms of the level of achieving that. Now a access consulting report was submitted as part of this application. Um, it, it has been shown that the proposal would meet the res code standard for accessibility, um, whether that's different to another standard that lies outside of the planning scheme in, under the NDIS that I can't comment on because it's not um, a requirement under the planning scheme. Okay, so just to follow up, you're satisfied um, that the disability access has been catered for in at least 50% of the apartments? Yes, that's correct. The specific requirements in relation to bedroom, bathroom layouts have been met for at least 50% of the dwellings. Thank you. Can, can I add through that, Mr Chairman, that Condition 1F on the um, permit actually specifies the uh, or requires that the applicant uh, nominate which of those apartments will, be, will meet that criteria. Councillors, are there any further questions? Councillor Brand? Um, just to test Ms Pound's encyclopaedic knowledge, um, I thought I'd just ask on behalf of, um, of, <laughs> of Mr Walter, those uh, particular provisions D10, D19, D24, that he picked out as um, being not, not met by this uh, application. He pointed out plenty of other things that mightn't have been met, but they were at least specified, those ones. I'm just wondering if you have any uh, quick comments on them or how well or badly what we have before us actually complies with those requirements. Thank you. Through Mr Chair, compliance with Clause 58 is dealt with on pages 346 and 347 of the report. Um, there have been identified non-compliances in relation to D10, which is landscaping objectives. Um, in relation specifically to the provision of less um, deep soil planting area than required under the scheme. However, at the officer level, um, we're comfortable with this, the variation because um, this development has had to balance maximising 
car parks, within a basement car park, with retaining trees, which they have been able to retain four uh, high retention trees or medium and high retention trees. So I'm comfortable that the objective has been met, even though the standard D10 has not been met. Um, D19, it also is discussed in the report that in part that is not met. It's only in relation to three balconies which do not meet the minimum dimension requirements but meet the minimum air, but exceed the minimum area requirements um, for their balcony sizes. So um, again, comfortable that, that, that these three balconies will still remain functional and usable. Um, now, I think there was another standard mentioned um, in relation to D24. Now, that standard specifically relates to the internal room dimensions um, of living rooms and bedrooms. Um, plans have been submitted as part of the advertising package which show compliance with that standard. So, um, I, again, I'm comfortable that the standard and objective have been met. Um, the issue that was raised in relation to the southern orientation is certainly dealt with elsewhere in Clause 58, um, and I've addressed that point as well as to how the objective has been met in that case. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from councillors? If not, do I have a mover for the officer's recommendation or an alternative? Councillor Gross and Councillor Copsey to second. Councillor Gross, would you like to speak to the motion? Sadly, I do want to speak. Um, let me start off with um, the observation that if I lived in this area, I would be nervous about a building of this stature uh, coming into my world. But in fact, buildings of this stature have come into my world. At the end of my street is a Housing First development of three storeys, four storeys, and at the, behind me is a private development of five storeys. And for all, a whole lot of reasons, they're all fine. In fact, I think um, the building behind me, the private development, which is, you know, huge, is a triumph of VCAT, who really got that right. So I was terrified, but it's sometimes planners get things right. Um, I'm mainly motivated by my... The, it's encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. So I, I'm really motivated by our officers who I think have done a really comprehensive, thorough and great job in looking through this design and development overlay and going through all of the points, and I've tried to tease them out and tonight we had, and I don't want to appear condescending or gratuitously nice to people, but I, you know, um, after one of the speakers spoke, uh, one of my neighbours here said, that's, that's one of the best presentations I've had at this council. So it was very high calibre presentation by the objectors and high calibre analysis by our officers it's not an easy decision, but I am going to take the officer's advice. One thing that did worry me was that the first speaker, the fourth speaker and the seventh speaker came and spoke about the moral worthiness of the applicant. And to my mind, that is irrelevant. And it doesn't matter whether you're a saint or a sinner. Um, Everyone who comes before this forum has to be treated the same. And um, so I have, I want to mention this explicitly, I do not care who the applicant is. All I care about is the technical analysis of our officers and whether they comply. And I really, I'm sorry I have to say this, uh, you know, from my rudimentary recollection of administrative law, to talk about the nature of the applicant is an invitation to make a decision on improper purposes. We have to talk about the technical compliance with a very technical document. And it was amazing to hear our officers in their elegant and sophisticated way go through all of the objections which were really well made by the objectors and meet them. And so that's why 
I'm um, nervously but determinately saying that this uh, application meets the high bar that is set by the planning scheme on this highly regulated site-specific site. Thank you. Councillor Gross. Councillor Copsey, would you like to speak to the motion? Um, I'll just echo that. It's um, great to have had people come and speak tonight and, of course, tonight Council is making a decision on um, the planning suitability of the application before us. Um, I also am very satisfied um, that we've got a good report in front of us and wanted to comment that it's been a really good discussion with a high level of detail and thank the um, submitters who've come as well as the officers for their very thorough response to all the questions tonight. Be pleased to support the officers' recommendation. Would any other councillor like to speak? Councillor Brand. Uh, thank you. Um, we've had a couple of stats, uh, statistics um, bandied about um, this, this evening. Um, one of them is there are 50,000 people waiting for housing in Victoria, which means that, um, and the other one that was mentioned was that there are hundreds of other potential sites for community. Well, that's, that's good news if there are hundreds, but we need 1,000 sites for community housing. Uh, of, of this size to get to solve the problem, and if there are a if we need a thousand sites and this one isn't one of them, I don't know where we're going to find them. I just it's this site to me is like it's an ideal site for community housing. It's near a railway station. It's near shops. It takes it adds no traffic to the street that it's ostensibly built in, Marlborough Street. Um, it doesn't overshadow anyone, it doesn't overlook anyone according to the regulations, it does so many things and it actually pre and it presents really um, a, an incredibly logical place to build a building of this size. Now having said that, I agree with um, Councillor Gross that what we're looking at here is actually not an application for social housing as such, we're looking at an application that we need to consider as a building, a development site. How would I look at this development site regardless of whether I was in sympathy of it being social housing or whether I absolutely hated the developer and thought they were terrible? How would I look at it? I've been over this building uh, with a fine tooth comb. I really took it upon myself to find everything that I thought was wrong with it, everything that I thought was non-compliant if I could apply the, uh, the, um, the regulations as best I could. Um, I, 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 I don't think it's going to be an architectural masterpiece. I think that there are possibilities that some of the rooms aren't well designed. Apart from that, and they are, that is not a requirement, I don't think, that we have of any of this, any building, I think it's going to be, even on those counts, a, a very respectable building, a very, and a, and a, a well designed and good looking building. I think the rooms have so many constraints on them uh, from uh, all of the requirements that go into them. They are bound to look a little bit baggy here and there because there are just so many different uh, regulations that they have to meet to be social housing. I think that's fine. Everything else I found completely compliant, completely um, uh, admirably and cleverly meeting the, the, um, the challenges that it has. Um, it's, it steps back really well. I think that you, know, you will only see, uh, only see maximum four storeys, probably three storeys. Even the people from Rosamond Street, if you look at their view cone, the thing that they will see is, is mainly the second and the third storey, a bit of the fourth. Well, maybe it's the... Anyway, they'll see around about the third storey. It's not... They don't even get to see the top of it. Um, if you look at that view cone put out, there are so many. Anyway, there are so many parts of this building that are actually, and, and and the way that this huge, complicated package is put together, it is really clever. It is really considerate. I think it has an urban idea of um, of that laneway. It'll make the uh, Balaclava Walk, that precinct beside the station, so much better by giving it a a, a public space and, and surveillance, passive surveillance, people and activity there. 
um, it'll be important for the neighbourhood. Um, I just think, as a development, this works really, really well in a place that can take it. You've got the great whacking station there, and all it, it's a huge structure that has got nothing to do with the fine-grained scale of Marlborough Street traditional housing, but it sits well in Marlborough Street. Nobody is complaining about being next to the railway station because of its inhuman scale. When we look at Carlisle Street itself, the future of Carlisle Street with the Coles car park and all of the supermarkets and the as an activity centre, it is going to be this big. We're going to see buildings like this. It is the future, and it is a, it, it's, a, it's the place which is absolutely fitted and well, well positioned for that future. And Marlborough Street is in a transition space between suburbia, beautiful, the, 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 the fine-grained, low-rise, old suburbs that we adore and we aspire to live in and love being in, and a bigger um, commercial and social centre. Um, there is going to be disjunctions of scale. That happens absolutely everywhere. And this disjunction of scale, I think, has been handled pretty masterfully, actually. All the little frictions and, th and problems that it is likely to cause are actually being designed out. It is a big building, but it is not a shocking imposition. In fact, I, was, I said this morning, I think it is really a well-behaved building in this site, and it's an, an appropriate building. And I, um, that's my analysis of it, and that means that I'm going to be voting for it. Thank you, Councillor Brand. Would any other councillor like to speak? Councillor Gross, would you like to close? Oh, sorry, Councillor Crawford would like to speak. I guess the question I keep asking myself is, would we, if it fits all the planning regulations and the res code and all that, would we allow this in any other spot in our municipality? And we have. Um, back of activity centres near public transport is ideal. Um, and it is the challenge of, of a city that is densifying, but there are more um, spots suitable to the larger builds, but they're happening everywhere throughout our municipality and I do believe that this application um, try to does it better than many of the ones that have also fitted the planning rules that we've approved so I will be supporting it. Would any other councillor like to speak? In that case, Councillor Gross, would you like to close? Uh, just to say two things. Um, Sophie, you raised some issues here which I share your disquiet so I'll be talking about that internally. And secondly, just to stress again, um, planning decisions are not popular mandates. You don't vote on whether people like, that, like them. I know that the community turned out at the consultation in huge numbers and um, expressed great uh, disapproval. In this environment, we are forced to cr make a decision on a quasi-judicial basis. Does it fit the rules? Not is it popular? It fits the rules, and that's why I support it. Thank you, Councillor Gross. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? All those against? The motion is carried. Division required. Councillor Simic has called a division. All those in favour? Councillors Copsey, Councillor Simic, Councillor Brand, Councillor Voss, Councillor Gross, Councillor Crawford. I can't, if you could, oh, sorry, your hand's behind. There we go, Councillor Crawford and Councillor Baxter. All those against? Councillor Bond and Councillor Pearl. That motion is carried. Item number seven on the agenda, urgent business. Councillors, are there any items of urgent business? There being none, we shall move on to item eight, confidential matters. Councillors, we have one confidential item tonight, being eight Palmerston Crescent, South Melbourne. I call on a councillor to move that the meeting be closed to members of the public. Councillor Voss, thank you, Councillor Voss has moved. Councillor Gross has seconded.
that the meeting be closed to members of the public in accordance with section 89.2 part D of the Local Government Act 1989. I'll now put the motion. All those in favour? I think that's a majority put their hand up. Um, that has been carried. Let's wait for the gallery to clear.